We are together again. What? He's back. <laughs> <laughs> He's back. Oh dear. Let me just say you, you miss me. I mean, it's understandable. I mean, you miss a guy. When you miss a guy, you, you know. It's always, I mean, don't worry. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. This is Sunrise, and yes, my crazy partner is back. Uh, and my name is Alero Edu. Uh, crazy? What does that make you? I'm Ayo Makide. Good morning and welcome. Oh, for a second, I thought you forgot your name. Um, no, I don't forget my name. It's my name. Welcome back. Thank you. But I was here last week, only not here with you. Uh, I hope you haven't been riding in the Kaduna Abuja rail. Uh, no. Uh, when it happened yesterday, uh, my colleagues and I on Sunrise Daily chatted about it yesterday. Look, uh, it, the, the mere the shock, the mere fact that, look, we could have been there. Yeah. I mean, for those who have used the road before, would say, that could have been me. Well, thankfully, we didn't hear of any injuries no or injury, any fatalities. No fatalities. Thank so God for that. Yeah. But it shows the level of desperation of these people who intend to sta destabilize this country. Hmm. What was that about? Well, it, it also shows the, the level of need or lacuna in monitoring such things. And it also shows there are so many, so many angles to mm -hmm. it. The MD of um, the rail, railway system, for instance, has said, you know what? We'll investigate. We are investigating. Mm. Oh, by the way, they said that they're returning to work today. Today, exactly. So, yeah, I mean that's exactly. gratifying. But um, what is it that's allowed, allowed or allowing these things to continue to happen? Yes. I think it's it's a it's a call for a, a reflection on some of the things that we do. Well, the president Indeed. holds security meetings from time to time, but there are those what do they call it now non kinetic things. <laughs> I'm, I'm, quite uh, frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of hearing uh, that no, word. No. Kinetic, kinetic and non-kinetic. Uh, it's English, okay? So. Yeah. <laughs> Big key. Mm. You know, so that's just, yeah, that's just that. Yeah. And then, of course, during the week, the biggie was the NSAS, um, should I say, memorial. Oh, yeah, that's what it was called. Mm. It was what it's called. Well, my own memorial came the following day, 21st. Mm -hmm. you don't forget that I was also attacked, reporting. Uh, yes, oh, yes. Yes. So my own memorial was 2110. Yes, and you had some kind of oh, cut on your head. Man, I, I, it's, um, it's a laceration that's going to be there forever. So, But, you know, looking at the whole thing, it's just another call, so to speak, to give attention to what is important. Um, many people may not know these things, that the, there was a conversation between um, some prominent celebrities and um, the police that, look, this thing is going to happen between 8 and, and 10. 10. And um, if you listen to the commissioner of police in Lagos, he said, look, the people we arrested, they are not the miscreants, they are not um, the, the protesters. protesters, Yes, they are the criminals trying to form in trouble. Yeah. And that uh, they caught one or, one or two of them with cutlasses. With, uh, well, with apart from the Uber driver, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well. Instant celeb. Mm. So the, those <laughs> things, uh, it, it just continues to oh. remind us of the things that are important and the things that we need to give attention but to. But the irony of, of it all, what, you know, what struck me is that the police uh, were there, mm. um, supposed to actually protect mm -hmm. the protesters and in no time at all they were seen attacking journalists and pushing them around and the irony of it for me was this thing has to do with you guys absolutely it says NSAS but at the same time it is saying we need the government to pay attention to the welfare of the police so that they can perform their duties better. That, and it is the same police mm. who is attacking you, who is fighting their cause. It's a, it's a quagmire. <laughs> it's a quagmire. It's a quagmire. As they because, say, yeah. duh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a quagmire because um, the people you are, you are protecting have a responsibility to protect the state. You know, including you. Including you. Mm. you know, they protect themselves as well. 
So uh, it's a it's a quagmire. I, I really don't envy anyone who is in the police. Yeah, because but they have, they've been in the bad books of Nigerians for a very very long when time. When you think about it seriously, Ayo, I mean, we were, I was I was at some gathering and we were talking about it yesterday. So you you expect to call up a policeman or call up the police station at two o'clock in the morning? I am under attack. Armed robbers are in my house, and you expect them to jump mm -hmm. and come and perform their duty, so mm. to speak. Well, the, the guy, he, he, he loses his life in the process. <laughs> what happens to his children? The, what happens? I mean, and he it. gets injured. For what who, happens to him? There you have it. There you have it. I mean, you employ a banker. You employ an individual to perform banking, banking services. You don't expect him to bring his computer from home. No. You don't expect you give him, him You give him the wherewithal. So, exactly. Do the police get the wherewithal? They and guess don't. what? They don't. Do, do the police have the kind of police station that they can be proud of? Do they, they have, have the sympathy of the people, have? truth be told. Yes. They do. They do. So, um, do, are we, as a country, mm. giving due attention to the police to perform the constitutional responsibilities that they have? I've said this over and over again. Ask <laughs> I've said this over and over again. The primary responsibility of the police is not to fight crime. To prevent. It's to prevent crime. There you go. But when we do not empower them to do it, we're essentially saying, uh, just earn a day's pay. You don't need to do your job. It's sad, but... That's the reality. That and is the truth. That is themselves. the truth. Then fend for themselves. Gratifying also to know mm. that at least the federal government says they are doing stuff in that regard. The IGP came up and said, We no, can't wait. We really can't wait. No. That's, the, that's the thing. So no matter what it is, no matter how persuasive government is trying to be about this issue, honestly, we're, we can't wait. We're out of time. <laughs> we, <laughs> we want a police wait. that we can be proud of on the streets. We do. So, we do. Sincere. You see a policeman in other climes, and their presence alone makes you straighten up and behave properly. That was in the 70s. You know? That was in the 70s. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now it's time for us to... Um, okay. All right, the then. So. Um, well... well. We started by talking about that thing that happened uh, on the Abuja Kaduna rail line. Yeah. So we're going to set our focus on the transport sector and security. Mm. Well, and uh, right after that, of course, you know that that is that vexed issue. Of how many are we so we can plan appropriately ahead 2022 population census? And then we'll be talking about the Arise Women's Conference. Or oh, your agricultural development will come next. Hmm. And what was happening with that one? I'm really curious. Well, because it's from there that we build. Okay, don't let me go into it yet. Hold your horses. You'll <laughs> find out today. What is dyslexia? Uh oh. Understanding the symptoms of dyslexia. A uh, related health issue would be World Polio Day, which is tomorrow. And then we shall close, as is usual, with the Artist of the Week segment. And, um, well, that's all I'm going to say about. about it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do what I say. Him? Not today. Or a shim? Not today. <laughs> Not today. So, um, do yourself a favor and grab your cup Co of... Uh, cocoa. Cocoa. Or Someone doesn't have hers. Cocoa. <laughs> <laughs> See you in just a moment. <laughs> Over the past three years, the Kaduna Abuja train service has been witnessing increased passenger traffic due to the spate of attacks by bandits on the Kaduna Abuja highway. But in recent times, there's been reports of attempted attacks on trains plying the route by suspected bandits, though no casualties have been recorded. On Wednesday night, a passenger train from Abuja to Kaduna was almost forced to derail after the rail line was cut off following an explosion. The incident, which occurred at the Regena area in Kaduna, also sent fear and panic to the passengers. One of the passengers narrates that a two-hour journey took six hours. We left Abuja around 7 p.m. on Wednesday 
and um, just approaching Kaduna, about 40 kilometers to Kaduna, between um, uh, Rijana and a village called uh, Dusi. And then we had a loud sound, bam! And suddenly the train started moving slowly and then it came to abrupt stop. And from there we've not had anything from the officials until after four hours. And then another train came forward, I mean rather a locomotive came and pushed us gradually. It took us two hours to get to Kaduna from that point. Meanwhile, daily activities at the Rigasa train station in Kaduna State were suspended on Thursday following the incident. Some of the passengers who had earlier booked their tickets online to Abuja were stranded when they got to the station. The news we are hearing is that either the rail line is vandalized or there is an attack on the rail, you know, uh, a terrorist attack on the rail, rail line. But from the operators of this uh, uh, commission, nobody has addressed anybody. And if you, if you came here about two hours ago, you see a lot of people, but now people are living one after the other. I've been here since 9.15, 9.15 a.m. this morning. I'm supposed to go with the 10.35 a.m. train to Abuja. So um, before it was 10.35, they gave us an update that the train has um, technical issues. So we should hold on, and when they get any information, because the network is bad, they'll get back to us, keep our tickets safe. The rise in insecurity on the Kaduna-Abuja highway forced many to abandon the road for the train service, increasing the daily volume of passengers by over 270%. But with the recent development on the rail lines, the authorities may have to do more to assure passengers of their safety. Now let's get the show started. <clears throat> On Wednesday, the news broke that suspected bandits destroyed a portion of the Abuja Kaduna rail track with explosives, forcing a disruption of train services on the route. Well, the Nigerian Railway Corporation confirmed and said that explosive damaged the rail track at a spot between Dutsi and Rijana, an area that had recorded Numerous bandits attacks along this Kaduna Abuja highway. Mm. So it is the same area where people who were even on the roads were attacked. So how is it that our security people were not aware that even the rail was in danger at that particular location? These are many more questions we're going to look for answers to this morning with our panel uh, consisting of uh, Professor Charles Aseneme, who is the Dean of the School of Transport and Logistics at the Lagos State University. Good morning, Prof. Thank you very much, sir. We Thank also you. have a security expert joining us via Zoom, Colonel Yomi Dari, retired. Good morning, Colonel. Good morning. Good morning. Thank Good morning to everyone in the studio. Good morning, Nigerians. Very pleased uh, to be here today. Thank you. We also expect um, another security expert, Mr. Oladeinde Ario. I'm sure he's stuck in traffic out there because the traffic on the high, on the expressway this morning is, um, as they say, you no get part two. Or, <laughs> as they say, itairapa. Itairapa. So, Professor. Yes, please. Um, maybe you got a few more details from that report which we played just now. Yeah. Now, so that particular part of the highway and the railway is, should I use the word, notorious? It is. So how come this happened? Well, it could happen because uh, we are still in the space called Nigeria where insecurity is high. Now, that Abuja, uh, Abuja traffic corridor, Abuja Kaduna traffic corridor has been notorious for attacks. Before this time, it was... Um, Whether by rail or by road. By road, rail, even those walking on the road. <laughs> Before this time, it was um, potholes we were experiencing. Mm -hmm. Later, the federal government uh, resurfaced the road, dualized it properly, and it was okay. So people passed. But when the, this banditry thing uh, increased, they attacked. Uh, transport is a soft target. 
they go for people who are not uh, armed, who are defenseless. You attack them, pick whatever they want to pick. Now, they've seen that uh, the traffic of uh, passengers on that road using road has kind of decreased a bit. Now it's real. Everybody's going on the rail because it's safer, more comfortable. Then they now decide to attack the rail. I think what they're just trying to do, apart from the attack, is to put fear in people. So that if they don't use it, the rail again, maybe they'll go back to the road or just stop commuting between Karuna and Abuja. But it's not, it's, but it's not possible. So it happens everywhere. But this is just uh, the, maybe the... It's not actually the first time. Mm. The Itakbe uh, uh, Wari rail was vandalized. So what is the, 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 there's no difference between putting a bomb there and the vandalization that took place in the Wari Itakbe rail. Because if the train had not stopped... Many people would have died if the train had uh, gone, gone off the, the track. So they are all attacks, whether it is vandalization or banditry, they are the same thing. Hmm. Now, Colonel, um, maybe this requires some kind of uh, special skills. How do you think we can secure the rail system nationwide? Very much. Um, I honestly, our our case is uh, is really worrisome, worrisome in the sense that we are all aware we've had red flags. First, Kaduna Abuja Road became a no go area, in spite of all efforts, including deploying military on that road, and then the rail line came. Okay, and everybody turned on to the red line. We have had cases where there has been threats, sometimes cattle, even on the rail line between Kaduna and uh, Abuja. Okay, now it behoves on common sense. It's just very common that we need to secure this rail line. And how do we secure this? We can deploy, you know, cameras to cover these rail lines or even deploy drones or even deploy helicopters to cover this movement. You recall the cases we had in the Niger Delta, where, where we had incessant you know, explosions blowing up of the pipeline. And at the end of the day, I think we were able to find some solutions whereby if there was any leakage or any tampering along, you know, along uh, the, the, uh, the pipelines, you know, the, the, the authorities, they get to know about it. So one expects that, especially with the wave or the incessant cases of, uh, of uh, insecurity, of terrorist activities, you know. So it behoves on common sense. It's just so common, you know, that we do, we do this thing. I, honestly, I, I think, you know, the major problem we have is corruption. Otherwise, we have spent billions, billions of foreign money, of money we borrowed to build these rail lines. And then to just secure these rail lines, it becomes a problem. I, I, I think we need, need, really need to, to check our psyche in this, uh, in this country. Because, I mean, I I intelligence has, has it. This, this period, both the aviation, all forms, our roads, our rail lines, even the water, wa waterways, it is expected that we monitor them seriously. So for me, it is not far-fetched. It is not a big deal. What does it cost us, you know, to cover this route? Apart from, apart from covering the rail lines with CCTV cameras, drones, and helicopters, even inside the, 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 the cabins themselves, CCTV cameras should be there because you can have terrorists, you know, embedded, uh, you know, in the passengers. So I, I think um, uh, uh, there, there's, there's need for us to wake up, to wake up. Uh, thank you. The same, the issue of uh, intelligence that I wanted to take you upon because I was saying, and I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again, I cannot imagine that with all the investments in our security apparatus, in all, this, all the investment of government in our security officials, security operatives, the individuals, the personnel that we have in the intelligence community in particular, I cannot believe that it'll come to us as a shock. I believe that we would know 
and I think you have also referenced it, especially given what is also in that report that that particular area is notorious for um, activities of banditry. But then, of course, we also heard the uh, Nigeria Railway Corporation saying, look, as far as they are concerned, it's a job of miscreants, not insurgents, not bandits, not terrorists, and all of that. Is there any way, given the intelligence that I believe, I do not have proof of it, but I just believe that we have extremely intelligent people in the, in the intelligence community in, in Nigeria, could we have been able to prevent this? And... Is there anything we need to do, you know, against the backdrop of what Alero said earlier, to ensure that this doesn't happen again, given all the investments, as you said, that we have made in this particular sector of our transport system? Yes, uh, Ayo. Honestly, just like you said, I mean, <laughs> as it stands, almost all of us, we know we have one or two things to say about security. It is, it is not rocket science. It is not rocket science. Like you, like you alluded, we have very, very brilliant people in our security sector here. What stops us? For example, once the, once the, 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 the train is on motion between Kaduna, I mean, sorry, between Abuja and Kaduna or vice versa, let there be coverage of their tracks. Worst case scenario, you deploy helicopters to move along with these with this, uh, uh, trains. And aside that, you know, like I said, even drones can also cover their movements. And then along the rail, uh, the, 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 the railways too, you know, you have control rooms wherein if anything untoward is observed, it can be reported. I cannot imagine, look at these poor passengers. They were there for four hours, for four hours before help even came. At the end of the day, a locomotion came to tow them and it took the locomotion two hours to tow them to, 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 to Kaduna. So you can imagine, you know, I mean, you, you, could, you could have cases, so many cases, so many things will have happened. I, I'm sure that if we even look deeply into this, maybe, maybe we must have recorded you know, some casualties in terms of uh, a loss of lives, you know, probably due to health condition or due to uh, some, 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 some phobic uh, 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 actions. You know? So, so like, 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 like I opined, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that is so difficult for us. But I, do, what I make bold to tell you that our major problem and our major problem here is, is corruption. Corruption. Because we can afford this. We can afford this. Let me, let me ask Prof uh, this, this particular question. Um, you are in this sector, or at least you are an academic in this sector, so um, perhaps sometimes some of these things are just too much talk and um, maybe there are some practical things that we should have done or we should do going forward. What are some of those, and I'm sure you may want to react to a thing or two that uh, Conor also said, but what are yeah. some of those things that you think we should engage, especially in this sector? We're tra talking about the entire transport system exactly. value chain, but for this one particularly, what do you think is a, a, a lacuna that we need to quickly fill? Well, I think some of the lacuna, uh, the lacuna has been mentioned by the Colonel. We don't just seem to be uh, serious about things. I mean, we built this uh, big infrastructure. The Abuja Kaduna Rail Corridor, or uh, the traffic corridor, is one of the busiest mm. in terms of uh, traffic movement in the country, apart from the Lagos Ibadan access to, uh, to Benin. So, if we have the infrastructure, we should be able to get security on it. Now, look at what happened in the Niger Delta that you mentioned too, when pipelines were being blown up here and there. They, get, they, they have a way, they, they, they uh, devised a way to ensure that the pipelines are safe, they put cameras the pigging system and everything. So, and the pipeline is even more, uh, more complex than what we have. This is just surface rail mm. that can be covered by cameras, that can be covered by, even there can be patrols there. They are not miscreants, the people that did it. This is, is terrorism, it's act of terrorism. Yes, I was going to ask uh, Kanodari if uh, miscreants, miscreants have knowledge of, of, uh, of, explosives. of explosives and no, all they, that. They are yes. not miscreants, these are terrorists. What they want to do is to kill people, to rob people, because to blow that, those, uh, uh, the, the lines are not just ordinary metal. They are heavy steel. So for you to blow it up, you must have very big explosive. And these clients don't do that. These are terrorist uh, uh, activities. They, they just, even the bandits, they call bandits bandits. They are terrorists. I mean, you don't just go about blowing, pipe, uh, blowing uh, rail lines. 
What do you want to achieve? There must be something they want to achieve which has not come out to the open. Hmm. But coming to talk about uh, transport and, um, and crime or transport-related crime, it happens uh, both on road, you know. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But hmm. these people here that did this, they are not these crimes. Oh, on the all. same issue, oh. yes. um, is it a global, is, is this something of global standard to put security apparatus on transport routes, such as rail tracks, in particular, given that what we're talking about? Or is it just peculiar because we have a security challenge? No, it, not, it's, it's global, it's global uh, standard. When you, if you travel, uh, if you even travel to Baltimore, all those corridors by the east side in, in America, those rail lines are covered. If you travel, if you travel even on road, from, uh, if you're going from London, if you're going to Manchester, you will see cameras all the way. It's covered. So it's not, it's not peculiar to Nigeria, but it becomes more... Uh, uh, more worrisome because of the particular situation we find ourselves. Yeah. Every day we hear of bandit. There's no day you tune uh, the, the television stations or any station that you don't hear 10 killed. 30 killed is a good every day. So it becomes more peculiar. And if we don't stop it now, they will be more emboldened to attack other rail lines. Remember, the Kaduna, Kaduna Abuja is not the only rail line. Yeah. It's because of the peculiarity of that um, yeah. uh, place because many people want to uh, move from Abuja to Kaduna. Yeah. It's not the only rail line. They can keep attacking. If we leave this one on, uh, they must go after those who did those things yeah. and get them. I don't even know why we keep uh, playing games with people like that. There are some countries you do that, they execute you. Because you are going to kill people too. Yeah. So we don't, we should, it's not something we just pamper and just, okay, it's just one of those attacks. It's not just one of those attacks. Be, given it's that... Sabotage. It's yeah. sabotage, big, big time. What? Both economic and human, is sabotage. Okay. Uh, let me ask uh, Colonel Dari, yes. because I don't want to put you on the spot being, being a security thing. Given that, uh, Colonel, that this issue of uh, this particular case on our hands is not happening for the first time in that area from what, what we have gathered. Uh, it is something that's been on. It's a, a, an area notorious for such activities. Is there any way of assuming or alluding to the fact that maybe there is some complicity with the communities or that the communities could have done some good by um, giving information to security operatives? Well, thank you very much, Ayo. I think that's a very, very important question you have raised here. Uh, you recall when uh, the road became so bad, so notorious, so impossible for people. It was suspected that the, the, uh, the communities along that uh, road, along the axis of uh, Kaduna uh, Abuja Road, where we you know, were kind of uh, 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 compromising and uh, you know, uh, uh, co collaborating with, uh, with uh, the, the, the criminals to perpetuate uh, the, 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 all, the, all the crimes on that, that, that road. And it was even suggested that they, they, you know, they should be raided and, if possible, relocate them, you know, from 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 those, those spots, you know. But nothing has been done. Nothing has been done. You know, the same the same way. Uh, of course, you know, anywhere you have a road, whether whether rail 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 road or or, or, or road itself, you know, I mean, anywhere you have um, <clears throat> passage of uh, people, you know, communities will move in there because it's an opportunity, it's an avenue for, for them to, to, to trade and make uh, some, some money. So definitely you cannot, you cannot rule out this. But the point right here is that we, 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 must have, we must be proactive. We must step up intelligence. We must be able to identify the people that are involved. You know? We must be able to do that. And this is not too, too, too much for us to do. But the point is that we are just so laid back we are so complacent, and it's just business as usual until something happens, and then we'll start running helter scatter. You know, I mean, look at what happened. Uh, the the uh, Wari Itakwe Road. You know, Wari Wari Itakwe Road. People were arrested. In fact, some 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 foreigners were even amongst those that, that were arrested. But as we speak, no one has had anything. I don't know whether you have had, but I haven't had anything. What has become of this? You know. Nobody has seen so. So these are the things that even give 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 muzzle, you know, to, to criminals to go ahead to continue to perpetuate their crimes. And like the prof the prof said, and I have said it severally, even on this platform and so many other platforms, you call them bandits, you call them uh, mia 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 miscrimes. What are we talking about? Mia miscrimes, toying with the lives of of people, 
You know, killing people, these are terrorists. As far as I'm concerned, they should be prosecuted, you know, and, and you, I mean, these are just simple acts of terrorism, nothing more. Thank you. Um, taking it from um, the angle which I took it now about the community, now that community policing has been approved, so to speak, all over the country, are we expecting to see better behavior from those communities where these things are happening? Well, honestly, I think this is one of the myths of the community policing that we are talking about. But right now, we, we, approval is just on paper. We haven't seen anything, you know, uh, practical. We haven't seen it in practice. And the earlier we start this community policing, the better for us. The better for us, because everyone will be involved. All the community heads, all the ward heads, they will be involved in security. Okay. You know? Okay. Uh, so, prof, um, still in the communities, and I'm speaking from your own perspective, um, some research, um, theories and all. What kind of responsibility uh, would communities that, through which uh, transportation uh, facilities pass, roads, rails, what are the responsibilities that they have in the scheme of things, the communities. Yeah, if you look at, uh, thank you very much, Ayo. If you look at um, transport and development, when transport, when a transport uh, infrastructure passes through a community, the community develops. You look at the Ore Road area. That express was not originally inside the town. Not, it was inside the town. They now relocated outside the town, like by passing the town. The town now grew to meet the express. The Benin Bypass is doing the same thing right now. The, Benin, uh, the, uh, the uh, city of Benin is going to meet the express. So if um, uh, a real infrastructure or any infrastructure at all passes through your community, it is your responsibility as a community to ensure that it is safe. Preserve. Because if, it, if you don't preserve it, if you don't get it safe, you will not be able to do business. Now, Ore is known if you're traveling from um, Onicha, they'll say we we'll eat at Ore. It becomes very popular. Right because Ore has gone to meet the town. So, but if Ore is not safe, people will not eat there. Mm -hmm. So the community has a responsibility to ensure that that infrastructure that passes through their community, they should keep it safe. What, what, mm -hmm. Is there a role for government in carrying the people along in that regard? Because, you know, mm -hmm. people may not know. Don't also forget, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's security related, but yes. don't also forget that there have been cases where people say, look, if we speak, to, author to the authorities, mm -hmm. these criminals are going to come for us. Yes, they do. So where do, where do the communities learn then? So it, it's like they are between the devil and the deep blue sea. The, the community is bigger than the criminals. Mm -hmm. Because you, sometimes you see, most of the criminals, they live in the communities too. Mm -hmm. They are part of the communities. They know them. The community is bigger than the criminals. All the criminals in Nigeria cannot be bigger than Nigeria as a country. If we just wake up to do what we're supposed to do. He said something about corruption. You hide uh, criminals in your community because the little thing you can get. When the uh, uh, pipelines were being vandalized and the government decided to bring a formula, okay, you community people, we are giving you the, uh, the contract to ensure that the pipelines will not be vandalized. Didn't it stop? It stopped. <laughs> so we can do the same thing for the roads too. If, any road is, if a road passes through a community and that place is being attacked all the time, we, we look at the community. So essentially, you are saying let's vote some money for securing for security for our infrastructure. But yes, of course, there should be uh, money for uh, security for the infrastructure because if you don't have it, if you have a road, if you have okay, look at the airport for instance, mm. we have we have invested massively in uh, scanning. You are going in now; they know what you're carrying. Unlike before, they just said you graduate. So, guy, what do you have for us? It has gone. We have gone beyond that now. When that little that gentleman, the Nigerian who tried to bring down an American uh, airline. It was, it was found out. Motalab. Motalab. I think his, his, his screen is, uh, his, his body somewhere in, in jail. Yeah. Imagine if there were no uh, subsequent equipment to even know that he's carrying something on him. You know, he has already beat, beaten the first security. But after that, security was, um, was raised, the bar was raised to ensure that even if you're carrying your bag, they ask you to remove your shoe. I feel, I feel I sympathize with those who go to the airport. <laughs> Maybe wear a lace of shoe. You yes. start unlacing it, you start with just simple dress. It's the reason I don't like lace up. I don't like lace up. <laughs> when I'm traveling, I like going, I like all my, the time I travel through uh, Turkey, I just had my phone on me, 
everything and plain. They were surprised how can a Nigerian travel without it. They, they came to snap me 10 times, but that is their business. <laughs> but you know, there should be an investment in security. And it's not just uh, because this thing just happened. If you look at transport and security generally, mm. on road, they hijack buses on the road, kill passengers, take them, uh, they kidnap the people. Mm. They, they even do, they, they can uh, molest women even inside, uh, inside, the, inside the bus. I was thinking one day, you know about this one chance thing. I was taking from Ilukbeju around uh, 7 p.m. I just 200 naira and I was going home. So suddenly they would, they would take me home. They just caught the bus, I entered the bus. They took me to Sulia in the night. They kept me there. I was not asking them, what are we doing? They started to keep quiet. Maybe they are waiting for arms. After a while, I started sleeping. <laughs> because uh, they kidnap you and you are sleeping. See, you are not serious. So what do you want me to do? Later, they released me. They took my 200 naira and beat me for having only 200 naira. I think it's a crime. So, <laughs> so I had to trek all the way from that place. So I didn't even know where I was. Anywhere I see road, I just trek until the police uh, patrol gave me lift and uh, asked, what you cast? I said, where are you coming from? If I told them where I was coming from, maybe they would have taken me away again to start giving statement for something I don't know. So they dropped me at Pangrove and they let me go. So these things are not, it's not new. It happens on road. Mm. The waterways, the waterways, look at the Gulf of Guinea. Piracy. The hijack ships and everything. So it's not new. Mm -hmm. Even uh, in uh, in the, the uh, even uh, pedestrians, you are walking on the way. A pedestrian will attack a pedestrian. I always tell people if you live in the, in a, in an informal settlement, like people, places that are not too formalized, don't walk in the night because you can get you can get kidnapped. You can get if they don't. Such things are not so easy in a highbrow or a formalized area. But it happens on uh, pedestrians on walkways. It happens on water. They hijack people on water. They even use boats. You remember there was a time they used boats to, I think, to rob a bank. I don't know the bank, somewhere in yes, Victoria Island. Yes, BVI, yes. Yeah, they they escaped boat. by boat. They escaped by boat. Mm. So they use boats to carry petroleum products, to smuggle. So mm. it, it cuts across all modes. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, Prof, let's, let's, let's look, look at the hapless um, traveler. Yeah. Um, Nigeria is complaining about the heavy... Uh, um, uh, traffic on its roads, yes. which is why it is now investing in really? the rail system to get more traffic, to get some of that traffic off, the, off road. the roads to preserve our roads. Now people are using the railroad, which we have spent plenty of money mm -hmm. to construct. This is happening. So you can't use the road because if you use the road, they probably stop you and kidnap you mm -hmm. anyway. They don't kidnap you. The road is too bad. You, you, you will get, you, you kill yourself it, driving. It, it can happen. You go on the rail. Now, they're bombing the rail, rail, railroads. So what does the hapless Nigerian do? How does he travel? Or is he not supposed to travel anymore? People, what, one of the biggest uh, cause of poverty is when you are, when you are um, fixed in your, your geographical area. You cannot move because you don't have money to move. So what, what it, will, uh, it will boil down to is that the poverty will increase. People cannot move to do the little they can do. Now, people want to travel. They can't travel by road because the roads are bad or because they, they get kidnapped or they get killed on the road. Now, they try uh, going by rail. This has just happened. You can't go by air either because it's like it, it, it is becoming the preserve of the rich. I mean, a, a, a one-way ticket costs, uh, the minute, I think it's about... Uh, 45 to 50, depends on when you get your ticket. Sometimes you get to the airport and you are just buying, you can pay as much as 120,000. You remember uh, Professor Abuja, Deomi? One hour. Yes. He paid, there was a time he was at the airport, he paid about 120,000 because he was traveling that day. So at the end of the day, what they are telling those who cannot afford air is that we should not travel again. And the moment people cannot live where they are geographically to move to other places to get a, a, a source of living, then the poverty will increase. So government has to increase security on the road. Before, we used to have a, a highway patrols, remember? Mm -hmm. Those men that look like British police, they used to be on the road. But somehow, what we just have now is just a checkpoint, checkpoint. Incidentally, you know? we still have, I still see them occasionally. Just patrolling. But we have checkpoints. Maybe the checkpoints, I don't mind spending uh, so much time on the to road to get... points. Uh, to, oh, wow, <laughs> if you call it that. <laughs> I don't mind spending so much time on the road to get there safely, mm. rather yeah. than not getting there at all. So the checkpoints, government should put more, and we should, we should be more sophisticated in, in, in securing the, the roads. He mentioned, the, the colonel mentioned uh, drones, right? A drone can, they can have them, they fly, they don't fly very far, but it depends on the kind of drone anyway. Mm. We can have drones that can cover up to 20 kilometers, 
they can pick it up from there until the entire road is uh, covered, or cameras that can pick some kilometers. If, if, if you watch some, uh, if you watch some, uh, some videos, you see where accidents happen, maybe in developed countries, they capture it on camera. Mm -hmm. That means the camera is there. Yes watching the road. So we should deploy that. Not okay. the type of cameras that they will put and tomorrow somebody climbs up and, <laughs> and they, they, they carry the camera and they pull. Mm. So well, Colonel, um, I, I don't know how, what you think of uh, this. There is um, this thinking in Lagos of what they call a smart city. Uh, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a project that's long term. So many cameras all over the city of Lagos such that many people don't even know that they are there. Uh, in terms of deploying security for transportation, first of all, do you agree? If uh, you do, I assume you do, what kind of uh, security deployment would you expect? Uh, uh, did we have them before? Uh, what happened to them? Stuff like that. Uh, uh, again, thank you, Ayo. Uh, you see, um, with with our growth and development, we are expected, you know, to 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 imbibe uh, the culture of uh, the latest technology in uh, securing our communities and securing our our environment generally. For example, in the past, it was business as usual, especially. In the, in the aviation sector, when before people even knew what was happening, people had a free passage for their drugs, you know, through all those shops you find at the, at the airports before you move in. They know the way they do it. But with awareness, those things had to be put in check. There's a limit to where you can move into now. And of course, the scanners, but one thing I want to say right now is that we seem to have taken things for granted. Even as we speak, the aviation industry in Nigeria is not well secured. It's not well secured. Once things happen, you see us adopting the fire brigade approach. And the moment, you know, we go into a law again. We must try as much as possible to sustain this. It is not out of the ordinary. It's something that we can afford. There's no big deal about it. The aviation industry, we need to properly, you know, cover everywhere with CCTV cameras. Like you said, almost everywhere, some places in Lagos now, you find CCTV cameras. But who is monitoring these cameras? Are these cameras working? Where are the control rooms? Where are the control rooms? Apart from individuals who try to put cameras in their homes, and of course, they are able to monitor them on their phones, on their other devices. But for the public places, for the common man on the streets, who protects him? Someone standing at the bus stop, the camera, there must be CCTV coverings, watching what is happening there. But these days, every day, every moment, you find people mocked, gabbed, raped at bus stops. You find those so-called one chance, just a like the, the, the... Just a second, Colonel. You've only raised more questions than answers right this moment because, I mean, there are those who are asking the question, what in the universe happened to the uh, security deployment of cameras in Abuja City? Don't answer that one question yet. I think you have some okay. more. We've since been joined by Mr. Oladeinde. Oh, Otumba. Oladeinde, <laughs> are you? I like that. A security expert. Good morning. I Good. think I'm back again. You know, I keep telling you that um, nobody can lay claim to be an expert in security. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the bottom knowledge required will take about eight lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do we describe you? Just a security practitioner. Security <laughs> practitioner, okay. <laughs> now, um, I would like to take your perspective on, um, uh, uh, reference the thing, the, 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 the uh, blow, blowing up of the um, rail, the rail line, the rail line mm -hmm. between Kaduna and Abuja. Okay. Um, how do you think we can secure our transport infrastructure? Your perspective. Thank you very much. Yeah, we can't take that in isolation. 
because the dynamics of our security and insecurity as we have them now they keep changing and they are changing because nothing significantly now okay is seen to have been done mm -hmm. to put an end to the, the proud situations i.e it's like graduating from being a pickpocket into a full-blown arm robber. <laughs> yeah because well, they, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm befuddled. <laughs> I'll the fact that, no, 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 I mean, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an unfortunate reality. Yeah, but that's the truth. There are so many things that we have, we could have done that we haven't done. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. For you, is there a game plan? Everything seems joined together, and I will try and connect them. When you look at the fact that, all over Nigeria, in different forests, along different roads, people get easily apprehended, kidnapped, ransom demanded, and they get paid. In more cases than, I mean, let's just say 90% of the cases, get paid. even when the security says, oh, they went there, they rescued the person, the people still say, we paid. Okay? So to that extent, it became like um, a normal Thing to do it be normal business that now generates more money than even armed robbery and then because it's attached to threats that's the critical thing don't forget that in kidnapping you always will think of target kidnapping where you have a reason for keeping somebody maybe for political reasons or you want to take a revenge but this is purely commercial so there's no point targeting anybody just random Kidnapping. kidnapping exactly. Whoever they pick becomes mm -hmm. a game. Because no, there's nobody here who doesn't have a, a relation somewhere who cares about you. But is that so when they get the phone calls and say, look, if you don't pay, that's what they kill the person. But is so there, they create a panic. Is, is there no, no concerted thinking? I'm not even talking about plan or effort now. We, thinking yes. to ensure that the lives and property of people are protected because that is the primary responsibility of government. And government, we will always hear from the authorities that, look, we're doing a lot of things. Some of them we can't even say we're doing. You see, we've said this over and over, and I'm going to say it again. We keep recycling criminals. Mm -hmm. How do you apprehend criminals or they surrender? Whether bandits, hoodlums, uh, headsmen, call them whatever name. Yeah, so and then the mean. first thing that will cost to you to is to rehabilitate them. them. All over yeah. the world, the, the principle and the rule of the game, if you can do the crime, get ready to, to do, do the, the time. time. Exactly. But here, we pamper criminals. And I keep saying, you can't continue hugging criminals and expect things to get better. People now know that, oh, they can do this thing and get, get away with yeah, it. Exactly. And because of the sexual nature of all of these things, it comes a lot more bad. Okay? Because I, I can't understand, even the victims of terrorism are neglected. And attention is now focused on so-called repentant or repentant uh, uh, criminals oh, no. or terrorists. It doesn't work that way. Besides, we now started playing with games, with the words. From terrorists, we now had bandits, we now had hoodlums and all of that. For as long as they have a common uh, thread among them, that is crime. For me, they are all terrorists. They all kill, they all maim, they all rape, they all extort, they all destroy their lives and properties. They destroy what people have spent their years to gather. So that gives people the new or the fresh impetus, okay, to continue. We've had that. Some of those people who are, who are so called uh, repented, I mean, they, been, they, repented, they went back again. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. now uh, let, let me. Uh, the gentleman before you have spoken a lot about a number of you know, things, especially as concerning the transport sector. Prof here was talking about um, insecurity on the waterways. And uh, there are a number of people who would always reference what happens to them when they travel between Port Harcourt and Bonny Island. Right. And, and uh, the, the, the issue, the question there for me is, is it so intractable that we can't nip, you know, my colleague would say it's not a, it's no longer a bird now it's a full blown flower. 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 So flower. we may not be able to eliminate insecurity hundred percent. We've always had pockets of robberies here and there, 
but not at the last scale. That it has now become a phenomenon. So that there is no day you will wake up in Nigeria today, you won't right. read about killings, Who mass is killings. responsible for that? I just told you one now. Impunity. Because people now know that they can do this and get away. Again, the security system too is compromised. In what way? There are criminals that have been apprehended. If they pay the right price, they get released. Some go, some yes. get to position level. Have this on good of, authority? After investigation, they are taking to this on good authority. But that... these are things we read about in papers every day. Mm -hmm. They get to the court. The lawyer gets them released on mm -hmm. bail, and before you know, they are back in business. Is that to say that the laws are weak, or there are a lot of lacunas being taken advantage of? Maybe I've not told you before. We need to reinvent Nigeria. And by reinventing, I mean every organ that make up the country called Nigeria, both from the individual level, the community, the state, the law, the security, and everyone, we need to be reinvented. Okay. Well, so that we can of, begin to have a new thinking, a new orientation that okay. will give us a new country. Well, kind of, you, you just listened to uh, Mr. Ria talk about the role uh, the, of uh, security operatives and that sometimes some of them are compromised. Do you agree with him? I do agree with him. I do agree with him. So, like we said, there's need for us to to really check ourselves. You know, when, when you say when you say security operatives are compromised, don't forget that it, it bothers on their morale. Okay, to say that that they are compromised. Well, maybe some of them, but um, to use that global word. I mean, you are in the sector, so you would know what that could do to the morale of the people. So when you well, say compromise, well, what exactly are you well, talking about? Well, I, uh, I will refuse to be put on the spot. In every organization, you do have some bad eggs. So there's no proof. You, just like uh, the Otumba said, you know, they, you can't have a situation of, uh, you know, where you not have uh, security threats, okay? But the point remains that we must ensure that uh, we, we, we put things, you know, uh, to, to check these, uh, these uh, threats, okay? And part of it is to ensure that there's good uh, intelligence gathering. And then when red flags are raised or where red, red, red flags are seen, we must, you know, be proactive. We must not wait until things happen before we start, you know, do, uh, deploying the fire brigade approach, you know? So whether we like it or not, I mean, we have had cases where we are, especially in the in the in the northeast flanks now, where soldiers have been uh, have been tried, you know, for one complicity or the other. So I am not saying all. Oh, of course, that is my constituency, and I stand any day to defend my constituency. But in every organization, in every uh, uh, whether you call it the police, whether the paramilitary, in whether the military itself, you know, sometimes you find people. You find fifth columnists there. You find people who are compromised, you know. So there's need to fish them out and deal with them accordingly. And most importantly, again, is the fact that, you know, he, he talked about, I mean, rehabilitation of criminals. I do agree with him. I do agree with him. If, 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 you, if you are ready, if you have been in the, in the crime, you must be, be ready to, to pay the price. You know, it's not a situation whereby you know, you have committed a crime and then somebody goes in there and, uh, you know, starts uh, trying to defend what is not defendable. You see, that, uh, and again, that comes to the issue of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, branding uh, uh, people, you know, uh, calling them uh, miscrimes, calling them bandits, calling them uh, men, you know, and these are people who are committing heinous crimes, killing and maiming people. As far as I'm concerned, these are terrorists. And the same law should apply to all. The same law should apply to them. And that brings me to the issue of, uh, you know, all these uh, 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 cases of, uh, uh, of people, uh, you know, militants here and there. In, as far as I'm concerned, for the purpose of security of our nation at this point in time, every militant group must be proscribed, must be proscribed. And if anyone raises their heads, if anyone threatens the peace of this nation, they should be dealt with accordingly. That's my take. Thank you. Um, Prof, uh, if you recall at the beginning that little clip which we showed, mm -hmm. the uh, passenger on that train said that they were on the spot for four, four hours. hours.
and there was no information, there was nothing before a locomotive came and towed them away. Um, this also borders on security again, or should I say insecurity? Mm -hmm. Because anything, okay, the train had come to a halt and they were on the same spot for four, four hours. hours. So they were sitting ducks. Those who blew up the train could, could have come back yes, and done uh, uh, anything, anything with the entire train. So what do you think, I mean, our pa passing on of information, our agencies, I mean, how would you assess their, their, their performance with, in, in regard to things like this? Yes, when I heard it, I was, I was, I was surprised because I, I thought after the, the blew up the, uh, the rail line, that they came to take them away immediately. I'm just saying that for the first time now, four hours. That means they could have been killed. It's just, uh, I see it as laziness. You know, sometimes a road is being constructed. Most of to your tumba, you get to the junction, you discover that no road, no sign somewhere to say the road is being constructed. So you are, you are stuck. So uh, NRC should have been able to pass information across. All the uh, security agencies should have been able to come to secure the area. Because from what he said, there was nobody there to secure that. They said they had only just about uh, just one escort or two on board the train. You know, so it's, it's, it's laziness on the part of uh, the government. It's laziness on the part of NRC. For them to keep quiet, no information passed. Some, uh, sometimes uh, you, you can be at the airport waiting for, even at the airport, they try a little. They'll tell you due, due to technical uh, uh, problem. Just tell us that. We know, of course, we know they are lying, but something to, to, for, for the people to hold on. You can't just leave people there. They don't know where they are going for four hours. What if those people come back? and read them, what happens to them? You just lose souls. It's pure laziness. What they would have done immediately was to, even a means flying a, a chopper down there to see, to assess what is happening, then report back and give the people, okay, we are aware of this, we're on top of it, we are, uh, we are getting the locomotive to come and pick the passenger. But they just kept quiet. They left them there. I've been at the airport once for about uh, three hours before the airline told us they are sorry. Sorry about what? After keeping me there for three hours, mm. just to tell me you are sorry later. At least they even said something, but not keeping people for four hours. What if they have been attacked again? That's laziness. If you would uh, advise the Minister of Transport, because you know that um, the, the federal government has been very, very passionate about this particular mode of transportation. Yes. And it's being re replicated all over the country, even uh, as far as the ports. So if you would advise the the Minister of Transportation about this matter because mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that he's very disturbed and concerned Of course, he should it. be. What would you advise? Well, like I said, uh, is to beef up security. They should make more allocations for security to secure the lines and to uh, learn how to pass. I sympathize with the, with the Minister of uh, Transportation because now uh, he's taking in a lot of things, doing this um, real thing, and you're working with people who don't even understand what you're doing. I sympathize with him a lot. So they should have um, an information system whereby if something happens, we should be able to report back immediately, even right there on the, the train. The person, I mean, we have officials there. We don't have even spoken to the people. Without, the, the driver of the train, if that is what it's called, is an NRC person. He should, he, he should be able to speak to the people. This is what is happening. We're expecting a, a backup. We're expecting this, at least to assure the people that they are safe and uh, they are, they are, they are, it's been. So for the, for the minister, it should, they should step up their information system. They should step up their surveillance system. Like uh, he said, nobody can be an expert in security, but you can do something. You should just step it up. Because these things are not, they happen, they've happened globally, everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, they've happened, so it's not, Nigeria is not an isolation. So we can learn from what has happened somewhere and what they did to ameliorate, not just uh, doing things the way we are doing it now. Okay. To support what you just said, yeah. the challenge here is our response to emergency situations. Exactly. It's been very weak and it has not improved over the years. I don't see how people will be stranded mm -hmm. for four hours. In four transit hours. for four hours and then nothing will come up. As it is now, whether they like it or not, if they don't have, they should go and buy helicopters and then establish um, online real time communication mm -hmm. with the operatives. Anywhere they are, you should be able to speak with them. So if that had been possible, I don't think those people would be there for four hours. Okay. Even if they wouldn't be evacuated immediately. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me ask you this as well, uh, especially concerning 
the responsibility that one can um, allude to to consumers of transport services because we are trying to look at transport sector security yeah. you know globally just yesterday on my way back from abuja um the the pilot said okay mentioned a specific seat number and said switch off your phone hmm. and after about uh, three to five minutes the fellow said the, the pilot said again, well, since this fellow has refused to switch off his phone, we're going to go back to the tarmac. We had been delayed for roughly six hours, six hours. before that time. So we're oh, on the dear. board already, and it's taken another hour on the aircraft, and this fellow refused to switch off his phone. Why? I think he's, he's not aware. Did you plan to make a call example. during the flight? Okay. Unfortunately... Now, I may not be able to mention those who are involved. Yeah, what was I, the, along with that line, what was the back you would, just a second. Mm -hmm. Along with that, you would also tell us what the attitude of transport service consumers, whether it's air, rail, mm -hmm. road, or water, mm -hmm. what should our attitude be? Let me, we were leaving Abuja for Lagos, if I remember. And this very top southwest political uh, 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 godfather was using his phone. And continuously they were announcing, please switch off your phone, phone and then fasten your seatbelt. But the man was from faith, he wasn't bothered. Those of us who were nearby, you know, Yoruba now, we respect people so much. Baba, please, sir, we were pleading until a bank MD got up and snagged the phone yes, from him and said, Look, right. if you want to commit suicide, go no, to your sir. family, not in this plane. I like that. Yes, he did that physically. Yes. I wish I can mention the name, but no, I mean, it, it, was, it was in the media. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know? they, 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 the pilot said, if this man doesn't switch yeah, up the phone, so, we're going to so return to the He jumped the phone from, and from this man, him. and then we now had so, uh, I mean, some measure of a, a, a peace, and then the, the plane took off. That should never have happened. We're not talking of elites now. We're talking of elites, people who have traveled the world. This is know what is do you know who I am? Yes. Mm -hmm. But you see, the mentality of do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? That you must now sub subject all of us to the best thing that are possible fatality. You yes. just reminded me of a joke I, I read. Yeah. The one someone said, Do you know who I am? And um, the service provider just made put took a megaphone and said, does anyone have help here? There is this man here who, who says he doesn't know, know who he is. is. <laughs> so if you can help him to know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you bring it down, if you see Okada passenger, when the rider dry, rides in the crazy version, he abuses the you, driver. You, the motorist now, mm -hmm. tries to like correct them. The passenger, the passenger, will, passenger. <laughs> will be all over you, calling you names, cursing you, and abusing you. Now, talking about vehicles, well, uh, by the mercies of God, I have not been a regular user of uh, commercial vehicles. But the few times I've had to use commercial vehicles, you see people who are so much in a hurry, I've been calling the driver speed to either take one way mm -hmm. or do whatever is possible to beat the traffic, mm -hmm. forgetting that. His life is also being endangered in case anything happens. Okay? And you see this at every point of our lives. We are a people in a hurry. Always in a hurry. That's why I said no we need to reinvent this country. People need to be taught how to live again and live like human beings. All the rat race, all the runnings, all the whatever we've been doing, they've not taken us anywhere better than... Uh, that Where we are now. Yeah. Correct. So we should... Correct. I, I, Otumba, I, I well, now we, need to, we need to start winding down. Okay. So I need to take your last word on this. Let me start with you, Otumba. Oh. Well, for me, it will be uncharitable not to acknowledge the fact that government, as well as the federal level now, they failed to provide Nigerians with security as required. And to that extent, the ball stops on the president's table. It, I find it very annoying when the veterans was saying that uh, what we have now is better than what they had in 2015. Must you compare two evils? I would be <laughs> glad if they can wake up. <laughs> yes, they, I mean, they, they should wake up and know that a lot of us do not have any country to call our own except Nigeria. Yeah. Okay. So we must make it work. Professor. Yes, uh, because my constituency now, I will advise the 
the transport constituents, especially it's being headed by the minister, Rotimi Amechi, to step up information and to, to demand that uh, security should be provided on every facility that, that uh, people move in. Because that's the only way we can move and uh, reduce this issue of, uh, of poverty in the country. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Colonel? Well, uh, Alero, uh, Ayo, thank you very much. Uh, my last word here is that uh, we must step up our game. The problem we have in terms of insecurity, it is not the, the lack of ideas or lack of the resources, but it is the complacency of the elites who, in most cases, are comfortable. They are in their comfort zones. They have all the retinue of security around them. So, so they, don't, they don't even see what is happening to the common man on the street. I think we need to change our attitude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Yomidari, retired uh, security expert who joined us via Zoom. And we had uh, two other experts in the studio. Well, practitioners. <laughs> <coughs> Otumba Oladeide Ariyo. I'm sure, I'm sure agree with me. <laughs> and uh, Professor too. Charles Asenume, who is the Dean, School of Transport and Logistics over at Lasso. Thank you very thank much you, for thank coming. Thank you very much for calling And me. just to, to give you a bit of nostalgia, in closing of this segment, I remember when I was little, when we would travel to the Midwest, we would stop at Akure, park the car, put out mats, and actually have a picnic. Yes. That was lunch, and then you continued your trip. Mm. Try that today. <laughs> your life Thank you for staying with us. We'll be back with another segment in just a moment. <laughs> Uh, you must have heard about the Arise Walk and the Arise Conference. We spoke about the walk two weeks ago, if you recall. And um, I hope that you actually took part in the walk. Either in the spirit or in the physical. Well, somebody said you can walk online. <laughs> <laughs> you can walk virtually. <laughs> well, today they've come to tell us about the other part of the program, which is the Arise Women's Conference. It's my pleasure to welcome um, a committee member of uh, the Arise Women team, Mr. Yinka. I was wondering. Oh, God. Okay, I understand. Um, Yinka Alumna. Almona. Al Almona. Thank you very much. Yinka Almona. Thank Good morning. You. Thank you. And we have the media executive, Yemi Moussier. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having us. Now, let me begin with you, okay. Mrs. Almona. Yes, yes. Um, this program has been going on for quite a while. I think about 13 years. 13 years Bo now. Before you, go okay. there, before you go there, can we review the walk of uh, two weeks ago? Has that happened? Yes, yes. it did. How, did. how did it go? It went well. Like, uh, because of the season we are in, Okay. Because the COVID of the, yes. <laughs> instead of having one uh, movement all together, mm. what we had was clusters. Okay. Then we had meeting points. Usually what we do is we meet at Murio Kola Park, then we take the walk together. Mm. But these, in the last two years, last year and this year, what we decided to do was have clusters in different areas of the country, not just Lagos. Within Lagos, we had Surumere, Ikeja, yes. From what we were told. Yes, all, mm. over, the all over the world. We had Switzerland, we have Borishas, we had UK, Maryland, Houston, all over the world. Maryland, now, Ikeja. Oh, Maryland, sorry. <laughs> Maryland in the US, yes. Look, look. Then, we, <laughs> <laughs> then we had clusters with first ladies coming in to build their own clusters as well. Okay. So we had virtual um programming where we could see what was going on everywhere what people was the were turnout like it was beautiful as usual Suru Lere, which was my cluster was quite overwhelming it was overwhelming hmm. yes. and how did you contend with the the issue you mentioned earlier the covid uh, we had mentioned that okay we'll be working together bring we had safety kits People had on their mask, 
then social distancing as usual. So when we had to sit down together, we had that set up in such a way that people were not really clustered, uh, clustered mm -hmm. together. Okay. Because after the walk, we came back to a meeting point in all the clusters, sat mm -hmm. down, had time together. Then, but there were more expensive ones. People took themselves out for breakfast after the, <laughs> after the after walk. The but we made preparation for healthy food, like snacks, you know, uh, fruits and drinks. We sat together, discussed about the conference, the upcoming conference on the 30th. Which we are going to look at this morning. Yes. So, um, my question earlier was, so 13 years of this, this is the 13th year, right? Yes, yes. So, how have you been able, able to assess the impact mm. it is having on women? We have records, and um, it's there for anybody to check, because we decided that we can't do this. It actually started as something small 13 years ago. I remember that it was on uh, Dr. Shiju's we call it the little round table in our office. And she called about nine of us, please come and partner with me. I have this vision. Let's come together. People are hungry. You know, women have been, have been um, they are demoralized. And this, when you empower a woman, you know that you've empowered a nation mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're the ones with the hands on the cradle. They rock the cradle. So we said, let's start with women. Let's empower them. Let's help them. Let's encourage them. It looks like something we would just do within ourselves. But we found out that through the years, after two years, we found out that we go out for medical outreach in schools. And uh, people would say, oh, you are partial to us. You are not coming to this area. So we started going. And in the course of going, we found out that, oh, renting stuff to use was getting very expensive. So we, she said, why don't we get our own ambulance? That, why don't we get our own mobile clinic? Why she would come up with those plans, you know? Sometimes we look at it and feel that, where are we going to get all this money from? Mm, mm. But she had a dream, she had a vision, and she was able to ride with it. And by the grace of God, We've, we've gone so far, and um, the mobile cleaning came to be. We have six other ambulances that when we need to go out, we go out with all of them. We go out with all of them. You the have mobile six clinic, ambulances? Yes, apart from the mobile clinic. The mobile clinic is a mini primary health care, health care center on its own because it has a lab. It has where you can actually, if you put to bed, like when we went to Abuja, 2016, yes, 2016, 2016, we went out for a medical outreach and to give out palliatives. It wasn't called that then, anyway. We were doing that, and a lady went into labor. And we're thinking, oh, maybe the ambulance is there. We said, no, but we can actually have the baby here. Uh -oh. Yes, yeah, she had the baby it there. It was in an high yes. DP camp in Abuja. Yes, yes, she had the baby there. And we said, okay, this is our rice baby. This is our <laughs> baby. So. Till tomorrow, we're still looking out for that baby. We had to empower the woman herself. And when we saw that, empowering a woman and the husband is really not doing anything, you need to empower the husband as well. So that's how we got into that. And in the course of reaching out to her, we discovered her village. And we decided to adopt that village. I think we'll come to that later. Have okay. I answered your question? Well, that, that, that question has been more than sufficiently <laughs> answered. Um, so the next conference, the conference is, is coming up really uh, soon. What's the theme this year and what's the objective? Thank you very much. The theme for this year's conference is Revive. And um, everybody will, um, will remember that 2020 was the year of the pandemic. It it brought a lot of despair, hopelessness, and all that. So the theme revive is really to bring people out of their despair, their hopelessness. It is for them to be healthy again, to go back to work. We are putting more women to work with this theme. We want them to go back. So many economics plunged into recession as well. So the theme revive is actually for people to, whatever you've gone through in the past year, it's just for you to go revitalize yourself and 
make sure that you do whatever is sustainable for mm. the future. So what, what then would you say that the team hopes to achieve? Uh, what, what do you think it will do to the development of our nation post-COVID? Thank you very much. Um, the Harai's model itself, we call it, um, Dr. Shiju Iloyamade calls it um, the Arise ideology. Um, we address um, 12 out of the 17 SDG goals. The, we address education, empowerment, leadership, mentorship, health, and all of that. So in the past years, what we've worked on, she has worked on um, schools. We, got, we have Arise goals to schools. Then last year, we came up with the Arise pink buckets, the pink buckets of hope. These are the buckets that, we, that contains um, maybe supplies for a family of two that could last them for two days or thereabouts. So we take it to their doorsteps to feed them. So in addressing, um, um, in addressing the SDG goal of um, poverty and putting um, zero hunger, we took food to their doorsteps. They harassed mobile clinics to had, like she said, in 2016, we could um, take um, delivery of a baby in the mobile clinic. Mm. Then education, we go to schools. Um, in Queen's College, we um, cater to the um, visually impaired students in Queen's College. We have um, the, um, what's it called, the Skills and Empowerment um, Center. We built that in Kabusa village. Mm. Then in, um, we built hospitals as well uh, in Dafara. In, in in Dafara. We, um, we've done a lot, quite a lot in nation building. And um, I would say that um, Dr. Shiju Iluyomade is a woman with a big heart and a mm. big vision. <laughs> Mrs. Amona, um, Arise headquarters is in Lagos. Yes. Do you have offices nationwide? Because this task, as you have described it to us, <laughs> it is not a local thing. Mm -hmm. You spoke about going to Abuja. Yes. You spoke about delivering a baby God knows where. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's been mentioned somewhere else. <laughs> so do you have branch offices, so to speak? Uh, for now, we have Lagos and Abuja. We have Lagos and Abuja. Okay. That's what we have for now. But that's solely... I wouldn't want anybody to look at it as the paparazzi of having first ladies mm. with us every year. Mm. There's a reason for it. We want to be able to establish and get them to partner with us mm -hmm. in this Arise ideology so that subsequently we now have offices in all the states, mm. representation. Mm. But you know, they will keep on telling us, I'm an Arise woman. Anything you need to do here, just tell me and okay. we move. I was okay. going to ask, how significant has the impact, has having the partnership of First Ladies mm -hmm. impacted on the project Arise Women? It's drawing the attention to the sustainable goals, sustainable development goals. If we, as a small NGO, like I would say, have been able to achieve 12, and they come every year, and they hear that, oh, we started from achieving three, to five, to seven, now we're on the twelfth one. It's a challenge. That's the way I would put it. Okay. It's a challenge to them that, okay, don't just come here. Look at what we are doing. Model it too for your community. And and how I significant think has that been? Yes, so far, so good. I think um, for we've had impact in the north, in the east, and of course, the Southwest, you mm. had a lot of impact. What they do is sometimes they even come back to us and ask us, how do you do it? How do you get the women to come? Now, it's not just about women. When we started, we said, oh, we're looking for a team. And we said, arise for a woman today. Every day, wake up saying that I will help another woman. But along the line, we found that the men were registering for our skill acquisition. And we couldn't send them away. You can't. We can't. We can't. <laughs> we had to do that. They okay, Yami. <laughs> Yami. Yeah, in mentioning the goals which you uh, were working on, you mentioned leadership. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are we expecting any Arise women to contest in the 2023 election? <laughs> <laughs> what is that for? 
Did I say anything <laughs> funny? It's coming up. It keeps coming up. It keeps coming, coming up. Coming so, up. Oh, okay. Good. All right. You asked the women to arrive. You can't ask They have a reason. Okay, oh, oh. can I correct a misconception? Okay. okay. Mm? This, when we started on that round table, and mm -hmm. up till this morning that I was coming here, mm -hmm. there's nothing like that. But if anything comes up amongst the committee members or any of the other Arise women, that they are called to come and serve, I'm sure they'll be willing to do so. Eh, but for eh, Dr. Inuyo Made, eh. she didn't come out so that she could go into politics. I'm not talking okay. about her. No, I'm, I'm talking, talking about, about those you have trained. Yes, those we have trained. Yes. The idea is for them to go and do likewise. You have been fed. You well, have been empowered. Uh -huh. Yes. Go and help others. If you find yourself, yes, we have people. There is an arise man that the wife started with us, and he would always be willing to help. Medical outreaches is now a member of the House of Representatives in Lagos State. Interesting. He contested, told us uh, he was going to the House of Assembly. Yes. That in he Lagos was or yeah. in Abuja? He's, ah, he's in Lagos. Okay, we we'll leave that no, one. He's, he's, yes. he's, he li he's inside. <laughs> <laughs> he lives on the island. Uh. So he told us he was contesting. So we know that from this, we are building capacity okay. for leadership. Okay. Yabi, you know? What? Yeah, um, over the years, we've had the Women in Leadership series where the big sisters mentor the younger girls <laughs> like us. <laughs> so what the big sisters actually do is that um, they... Um, they invest in us. For instance, I have I have gotten a lot of skills and on skills that I learnt through Arise Women. So they they mentor us to do bigger works than them. So, so are you going to go for the, the local <laughs> government chairmanship in your area? Uh, my own case is quite unique. Um, I'm um, I would say I'm mixed breed. I'm Yoruba, and my husband is Igbo. So. <laughs> Okay. And you know how the Nigerian system is. But, so, but you live here. I live in Lagos. You can be the local government chairman <laughs> in your area in Lagos. Well, wherever we find ourselves, Maybe she we wants are built to, be to make it. In, 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 in yes. Sorry, sorry. But you said something earlier that if they are called upon, nobody sits down and waits to be called oh, upon yeah. because nobody is going to give you anything on a platter. You have to go get it, especially if you are a woman. A man isn't going to hand over anything to you. Yes. So I wish you would just encourage your women mm -hmm. not to wait to be called upon. That's exactly but what we're But put forward their skills and their willingness to do the job because it is a job. I know. I know. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're doing now. Okay. We're telling them, like she said, at the women in leadership, what we say to women is, come, let's talk, let's reason together. And we sit down, we tell them that, imagine yourself being a first lady tomorrow. Mm -mm. That's a given. It can be a given. But imagine yourself being a deputy governor a, or the first female governor. In Nigeria. Or the local government chairman, a so chairperson. All of this is getting them ready for that position, for that leadership position. Okay, just one last question because okay. we're out of time already. Okay. What's the idea behind this Arise Community Insurance Scheme? Yes, like we said, empowering women. Okay. Some women feel that, oh, they have to be in a position of a doctor, Shiju before they can do what she's doing. Okay. And we're telling them, especially people in government now, that you can actually, for 15,000 Naira, feed a family without lifting a finger. So you want to tell me, I want to feed 10 families in a month. Then you pay 150,000. You are partnering with us to be able to take food to those people okay. on your behalf. Okay. That when they have medical issues, we are able to attend to it. That's okay. exactly the idea. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we wish you all... Well, by the way, what day is the conference? 30th, next week, Saturday, a week from today. Okay. 30th. And uh, virtual... It's going to be as well an as hybrid conference. Okay. Yes. It's going to be a physical um, 
um, there is going to be a physical um, gathering. gathering. The physical is gathering where? Um, uh, we don't want to disclose that fine. because okay. um, of the COVID restrictions, okay. are, but it will be televised on all social all our social media platforms and it's going to be on major tv stations exactly okay. yes. yes. all right Charlie 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 thank Charlie you so much you, you through really the years you held readers. our hands okay yes. and we're grateful you. thank we're you grateful. very much for coming yinka almona mm -hmm. committee member and yemi musie media executive both of arise thank you Women. for having us thank, thank you, you very much us. and good luck you. through your conference thank you Mark. Sunrise will return in, a, in just a moment with another interesting conversation. Do join us. Yeah. That's the next item on the, to use um, Zerudaya's words, the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the singular. Oh, well. Yes. No, no, no. We have an agenda. Uh -huh. Okay, the next agenda. <laughs> <laughs> so, agriculture is what we want to talk about now. It's a favorite topic of mine because, take it or leave it, it's, it's a major occupation provider. Uh, and My partner wants to be a, 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 an, an agriculturist. I am already in agriculture. I'm already in agriculture. No, I didn't say farmer. I'm yeah. already in agriculture. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, give you a sample. I give you a sample. I give you a sample. Of Agbekoya. <laughs> so, um, a large portion of the people of Oyo State uh, are engaged. Uh, over 70% of the state's workforce are in this practice already. Oyo State has a population of 415,030 farm families, according to the 2007. Hmm crop enumeration exercise well maybe your state should actually be the basket food basket of the nation but we don't know that but yet let's let's get into the conversation don't, don't um, let ben wasted hear you nah. <laughs> i won't let them hear <laughs> well he's um uh dr Debo akonde is our next guest is uh, executive advisor on agribusiness or your state and director general of oil state agribusiness development agency oisada thank you for joining us this morning thank you for having me um let me f start by accusing oil state ah. yes your state is my state so okay. i can accuse you Good. of taking the back seat in agriculture yeah. Um, uh, over the years, because we all know we are all beneficiaries of some of the big things that agriculture did for the Southwest in the First right. Republic. And um, the famous Cocoa House Coco is House. a monument to, the, to that claim. So, Indeed. what happened? And how are you reversing the trend? Oh, uh, thank you very much. Hi, I heard you earlier saying that, uh, and I think I heard Madame Malero saying that uh, you are an agriculturist. Uh, probably you are a farmer or an agriculturist. I think I will start from there. I'm hoping that you are not aiming towards the uh, cutlass and hoe agriculture. That was my grandfather. And then you, ex <laughs> exactly. And that is where we're going to be starting from. Okay. Um, what we've had, uh, uh, when we came on board, we, I did an analysis of, um, what has been going on in agriculture um, within the state. And by the way, as a way of an open declaration as well, I work with IIT. I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. I still work with IIT. Mm -hmm. And um, I look at the financial aspect, you know, look at the budgetary allocation and things like that, um, policies, programs. And let me start from the, from the financial aspect. From 2017 to 2019, um, you find it very difficult to believe that the total budget that is allocated to agriculture is around 3.39% of the total um, budget of the state from 2017 to 2019. It is not enough to just look at that. Of that 3 point something percent, let's, let's even say around 4%, the total spending is less than around 20%. Okay. Of the 3%. The of the 3%. Uh -oh. Why is okay. that? I will go to that. And if you look at the, the around 20% that we are making reference to, you look at where they are allocated towards, then you start seeing the reasons why Oyo State has gone back on the issue of agriculture. One, African Union, CADA, recommend that for you to do anything significant in agriculture, 
your annual budget spending, not allocation, should not be less than 10% of your budget. Of your Ouch. budget. So, if you look at what is going on, it means that the state has not, during that period, prioritized agriculture. You may prioritize agriculture by word of mouth, but your actions need to be seen going into that particular area as well. So if your resources is not um, allocated towards that area, then it's an issue. I also made a reference to the fact that where is this budget going to? Less than 5% of that budget is what goes to what we call the rural infrastructures. Okay. Now, agriculture in this DNA age requires quite a lot of resources. Agriculture in this generation has gone beyond the issue of cutlasses and hoes. We are making reference to what we can call industrial agriculture. Um, I've had on numbers of occasions where um, we have, uh, as a nation, mentioned that we want to diversify from um, oil to agriculture. And I question um, the action we are taking you know, towards that particular area, especially uh, what we are doing in moving from rudimentary agriculture, the, the um, subsistence agriculture, mm. to a more of an industrial agriculture. Okay. If you are focusing towards industrial agriculture, and I'm going back to your state now, one of the critical things that you need to do is to ensure that your infrastructures in the rural area are well built and tailored towards those industrial agriculture. Uh, that, that's quite a huge spending. Um, as I said, uh, I've had to visit rural parts of, um, some rural parts of Oyo State. Yes, and I, I've found out that um, the rural infrastructure is not even anything to write home, to yeah, write about, correct. much less write home about. Very correct. Because <laughs> the, if anything, if memory serves me right, the infrastructure that we had in some of those rural areas, they, in my opinion, date back to the 60s. And there, has been, there had been nothing done to upgrade that. And we, you also know how difficult it is to transport anything from the farms if we do not work at that, what's the priority in that regard? So what has happened, the narratives changed when this government came on board. And I'm giving you um, data that you can um, look and check yourself. From 2020 up until now, the budgetary allocation to the agricultural sector has increased, has improved. To, to what? To um, this year, we have around 8.7% of the total huh? Um, it's not up to the 10% yet. But we're coming. But we're, we're, we're coming. coming. Exactly. <laughs> from 6.68 uh, to 8.7. It's not and before just, that, from before 4. Point we, we, I found that where there was a 2017, it was around 4.2%. Uh -huh. At 3.1%. So know, we, we, point, we, we've doubled it. We've doubled it. Okay. Beyond doubling it, we have also ensured that these budgets are rightly allocated towards what is going to create an industrial agriculture. What do I mean by that? Over 62% of our current agricultural budget is going to agricultural infrastructures within the state. Mm. Around 20 to 30% is going towards support for young entrepreneurs in agriculture and the rest for smaller farmers. It used to be the reverse in the past. This budget is also complement, complement, complemented by other budgets within the state as well. I can rightly tell you that the local government this year supported the state with close to around one billion on agriculture. The local government. The local government supports exactly. Wow. Support state. That makes a change. Exactly. I, I'm Normally, wondering. it's the other it way around. Not, it is not as if the state gave. I mean, the, the local government gave this the fund to the state. That's not what I mean. I mean, no, I'm, I'm, but it support the strategy in relation to agribusiness. So they focus. They have close to around one billion that they use in supporting training of young young enterprise. You know, in agribusiness. Pause. And it is their fund. Pause. Yes. I'm hearing for the first time in how many years, Alero, <laughs> that local government is supporting state, state not, government. not state government telling local government no. what to do. So what happened was that when we came on board again as well, we looked around for what are the strategy that the state base, that the state is using for agribusiness. We didn't find any. So there is a strategy now that we defined, designed, we worked on. And part of that strategy, one of the key components of the strategy is how to create a new set of um, 
actors in agribusiness. Mm. The youths are one of those ones that we have identified. And when the local government chairmen were elected, I was one of the people that did a presentation to all of them about what is the strategy of the state in terms of agribusiness. And they bought into this idea as well, that at the local government level, they also want to engage. Mm. So if you hear that the state is training youth in agribusiness within the state, as a matter of fact, most of these states are picked by the local government, uh, um, different local government. Forgive me mm, for stop. bringing this up. I, be, I, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon. Um, I must um, call to mind mm. a conversation we had That's with a going. lecturer in agriculture of the university mm. who told us point blank that students were not interested in going into That's the question I was going to ask you. Well, um, <laughs> he may be right. She actually. Or she, she may be uh, right. They may not be interested in going to agriculture if what you portray to them is the agriculture of classes and, and hose. hose. Mm. Okay. What we are talking about in Oyo State is agribusiness. We are making a reference okay. to okay. agriculture, okay. not just what agriculture. is agribusiness. Exactly. Thank you very much. Break it down, please. I always like to use the creative hats as an example of the difference between the agriculture and the agribusiness. And what do I mean by that? And I think that is what a lot of resonate with a lot of Nigerians. If we make reference to creative arts as the combination of the music and the film industry combined together. And I remember that there was a generation of the Ogundis, you know, that started it and they were just probably doing it because it's something that is okay and is nice to do. And of course, they had a bit of resources here and there to survive. Then they moved to another generation of probably the, uh, uh, the Baba Salas and of this world. And, uh, and that started with creative industries that are just probably providing money for them to, to, to pay house rents and, and, and basic things like that. I used to remember that even costumes that they were using in those days were costumes that probably you will see in different films. One costume that four or five of them were using. And they had to hire. And then suddenly something happened. You have the generation of your Don Jazzy, your Genevieve, that trans translate the whole creative industry to more of a business. So what changed? What you find that is very critical to the Ogun days and your, and your Don Jazzy and your Genevieve is that one, they no longer see it as a cultural thing. They no longer see it as a pastime. Mm -hmm. It becomes it's a, a business. business to them. The second thing is that they adopted the use of innovations and technology in what they are doing. And they, they didn't just see it as something that can just pay their bill. They see it as something that can create wealth. Yeah. Okay. And they move towards that. And now we are talking about seeing something that is creating, uh, supporting the GDP of this country, you know, from yeah. the creative. That literally in a layman term is what the differences between agriculture and agribusiness. But then perhaps that also speaks to the need to rejig the um, academic curriculum to the effect. Because unless what you're saying is included in the, in the curriculum to teach accordingly, the teachers are still at a loss. Anyway, I'll let you go deal with so that. So you are right. And what we've done within your State uh, is that um, creating the mindset within the young people Mm. and ensuring that there is a, an orientation and change in their mind towards agribusiness. We are currently training or retraining a good number of young people within the state now. We started with 1,000. Mm. Excellency said we should move it to 3,300 so that to be able to allocate to every local government now, it has increased to 10,000. Okay. Well, we don't have much time, my, my sincere apologies. So mm. let, let's look at... Uh, so this... Or your agricultural development plan, That's right. what is it? So this plan is the guiding uh, light, if we can call it in that manner, as to how to move Oyo State from where it is now to ensuring that agribusiness truly support the economical development of the state. What is this that we're seeing on the screen? Can you talk to us? So this is one of the training that is taking place for the Oyo State um, Youth Entrepreneurship Project now. Okay. Uh, like I said, 10,000 of them are currently being trained, and those, those people that you are looking at there wearing are hats. all Oyo State citizens. Wearing um, hats. Wearing hats, you know, being trained in the modern approaches to agriculture. 
or agribusiness, as it were. Just okay, on a, so just, in other just words, on the side, mm. just on the side. Uh, so the, the hat must also be very modern. Yeah, you were saying <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you are now trying to displace Benway as the food basket of the country. Well, in reality, I think we we are not even using Benway as our benchmark. Oh. Okay. Okay. So uh, where are you using? Uh, we. Uh, if I can give you something very small statistics, Oyo State's land mass, 28,000 square kilometers, is bigger than the whole of Rwanda as a country. It land mass Eye -opener. is bigger than the whole of the southeast of Nigeria combined together. That is even divided from Osho? Oyo State, as it is now. Mm -hmm. Bigger than the whole of the southeast of Nigeria. Belgium is just 1,000 square kilometers bigger than Oyo State. So we are benchmarking ourselves against combined southeast of Nigeria. Rwanda or Belgium. Okay. okay. And what's the goal? What's the Ambition. goal? Ambition. Yeah, I mean, yeah. because, you know, the, the, the challenge for me here is uh, even the president said, if you remember, was it 40% or 20% of, of Nigeria's landmass that is being used for anything, habitation, agriculture, whatever it is. And I'm pretty sure it's the same for all your states. You know, with all of the arable land, how much of it is being used for anything? Currently, maybe we are using less than around um, 5%. I did an analysis and I said that even if we have up to a million farmers, smallholder farmers within the state, if we have up to a million farmers, mostly smallholder farmers don't do le less than half, half an hectare. Wow. At most. FAO data, any data. That means that we are only using around um, 5,000 or less than 5,000 square kilometers of the 28,000 or 26,000 square kilometers that wow. we have in the state. So there's large room and for over 70 percent of this land is arable so what are you waiting for so that is what has determined the <laughs> actions we are taking now i probably think you've heard that we are establishing agribusiness industrial across the whole of the state so we've started we are not it's not hypothetical we are not saying we are building we started okay. building it okay so the popular and known fasciola is oh. now being revamped okay 1200 hectares of land you know, being built as an agribusiness agri industrial hub. Mm. We are doing similar thing in Erua. We have close to around 10 to 11 um, farm settlements that were left money bound. If, I, if you go to the state, I, I will be honest with you, at a point in time when I get to, got to one of these places, I shed tears. Mm. I couldn't, I became emotive. That, so some people have vision to establish this kind of a thing, you know, in the 60s, and um, some generation came and they left, they allow it to become um, uh, moribund. But sometimes it's frustration. The system frustrates them. I agree. You know, yeah. but the fact remains that have we genuinely even focused towards... I remember when we came on board and we have discussion, we have our time to discuss with the sectorists. Uh, and the agreement we had with his leadership is that mm. we will ensure that all our support that we are giving in terms of infrastructure are focused towards the agribusiness. What, and it started with that. What, what's happening sorry, with Coco? We, we, we have to go. But before we go, um, you may answer this, that question in this, in this uh, space. What are the opportunities and what's the entry point for anyone who wants to invest in agriculture in your state? You know and I know, and many people would, would, would hold that opinion, that doing business with government is a problem because of bureaucracy. So right. it's, it's high risk. <laughs> it, so, is, it is high risk. So what's the, is there a genuine plan, a consolidated plan, maybe like a one-stop shop that, okay, you want to do business? So I, we know that this problem is existing, and that is why the state established the Oyo State Agribusiness Development Agency, okay. which is now the one-stop shop for all private investors or all investors in agribusiness within the state. And I, have, I happen to be the, the, the DG of the, of the agency. Dr. Akonde, okay. you yeah. have to really vet the staff that you employ so that they're not, they don't frustrate people to come there and then they're asking for you know what. There's a very strong monetary and evaluation system within that uh -huh, particular organization okay. to ensure that that thing that you're talking about. Uh, that yeah, thing, that's, what, that's what that kills, thing, kills that a thing, lot of these. That thing is. That's what uh, kills uh, a lot of these uh, ideas. Of my head, so, um, <laughs> but I have to thank you very much uh, for, for being here today. Thank um, you for having me. Dr. Dr. Deborah Conde, because all of the things that you're talking about, well, um, you know, Alero has exposed me to you already, so mm -hmm. maybe <laughs> some he she will be knocking on, my, on your door, my behalf. Yeah, more I'm back on you. Well, mm -hmm. Dr. Debo Akonde is executive advisor on agribusiness 
in Oyo State, and he is also Director General of Oyo State Agribusiness Development Agency. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you very much for having me. This morning. Thank you. Yeah. So, Sunrise continues in a mo. Do stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. You will recall that the plans to hold a uh, census in 2021 had to be postponed owing to the incessant security challenges plaguing the nation. But the National Population Commission is now ready, geared. Hmm. geared to go on with the census for 2022. You know, the, the, this census thing reminds me of one song. I can't sing it right now. It was by... What did he say? Only a wakawa, senso. A wakawa. Senso. A wakawa. Senso. A I know. The song with the people says, come and count us. Well, um, I hope that publicity is going on so that people know that census officers are going to be coming out soon. Interestingly. To count. Interestingly, Alero. One of the ways that we did these things in the past was to put all these messages into music. Well, significantly, you remember all of the apartheid campaign and all of that uh, in South Africa. A good number of musicians in Nigeria did songs about them. This census thing that I talked about, family planning, all those things. Those are the things that they put in music, and people will remember they them will not because forget. those songs will resonate. Certainly. Yes. But anyway, maybe, maybe there is a plan. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe we, will, we will somewhere. ask um, the Federal Commissioner of the National Population Commission, Lagos State, Barrister Bimbola Salu Hundei. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And I'm so glad to be here today. Thank you so much, Channels, for always supporting the cause of Nigeria. Well, you see, we have so many questions to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> but let me start by asking, 2021... I mean, we are at the dying moments of 2021, 2022, just around the corner. How prepared are you for this census uh, exercise? Thank you very much. I can let you know that we are fully prepared. Fully? Yes, yes I can tell you that. Wow. The major preparation for the census that actually kept us a bit behind was the enumeration area demarcation. Okay. And I can tell Which you, you spoke now, about the last time yes. you were here. Now we've done about 95%. Okay. For example, in Lagos State, we only have two local governments left and maybe an update and then a mop up of some other areas mm -hmm. because we keep getting calls, you didn't come here. We want to be sure that we want to ascertain that we've covered everywhere. In Lagos State, we've done 18 local government areas, and right now we're in Ali Mosho local government area, mm -hmm. where we're carrying out the enumeration area demarcation. Like I did say the last time, of course, enumeration area demarcation, simply put as EAD, is the dividing or cutting a country, a nation, a state, a locality, a local government into smaller, smaller portions, so that when it's time for the proper census, we're able to assigned to a pair of enumerators to each small, small portion. Mm -hmm. A small portion is a polygon, and that's what we call the enumeration area that we have demarcated earlier on as we do now. Mm -hmm. You would also recall that I did say that for enumeration area demarcation, we take our time. Some take about five to six weeks, between four to six weeks, because we must make sure that we cover every building is counted and numbered. Every standalone structure, if it's your generator house, if it's standing alone, we number it. The dog house, the chicken house, the fish, everything, commercial building, we must number every standalone structure. But when we get to a residential area, you tell us somebody is living here, then we ask only one question that we ask during enumeration area demarcation. It is in census that we have a plethora of questions to ask mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And the only question we ask now is, how many households are in this house? And like I did say... How many how households being families, not no, just individuals? No, not family. Okay. That is not the demographic definition of household, household. according to our own census okay. demographic definition. Help us understand better. Yes. Household means it is based on catering arrangement. 
We have seen from experience a couple, a husband and wife, and they are two separate households. Why? One of them has health challenges. Oh. So they have to do the cooking separately. We've also seen a couple who eat separately from different pots, not because they quarrel or anything, but because one is a vegan or a vegetarian mm -hmm. and the other eats normal food. So what, how do you determine a household? It is based on catering arrangement. If you eat separately in a house, then you are one household. In some homes, you have a father who says, okay, my young my son has left university, he's working now, but he doesn't have accommodation. Okay, I could give you accommodation in my apartment, but you eat separately. Mm -hmm. Then, when we get... That's two households. Yes, it's a separate household. Oh. If you have five wow. youth coppers occupying a three-bedroom flat, or six youth coppers occupying a three-bedroom flat, but they all cook separately, six, six households. households. You have a grandmother that eats separately because of her old age. Mm. Your cook does not eat from the same pot. Your cook cooks in the boys' quarters. The housekeeper does the same thing. They're different households from you. Your security guard cooks separately at his post, or he goes to the BQ to cook. He eats separately. It's even like this. In places like Alimosha, that is very local. That's a very local area. You have people, they're about six, eight, ten in a room. Some have stoves and maybe one pot. Some don't have. They go to Mamala Mala or Yangazi. They're a different household. It's purely based on a catering arrangement. And then when we move from house to house, but we must number every standalone structure. Whether it's a fish house, once it has a roof on it. When we get to places like markets, we oh. determine the numbering <laughs> by the kind of roof. Once your roof is even from the next tall's roof, it's a separate building. So we number everything. The reason is in Nigeria, we just don't do census. We do population and housing census. So we must count every structure because that constitutes the housing aspect of the census. And then when we count all these, we then get to some particular buildings. You know, now we've also leveraged on technology. It's not like in 2005 where everything was paperwork. Mm. Now we have a personal digital assistant and we've taken the pictures, the map of every local government through satellite imagery. And we have the GIS inbuilt. And so we go with our PDA. When we get here, you open up your map. It tells you exactly where you are. This is channels. And this is um, where you are in channels. That brings to mind all these um, people we hear coming to Lagos by trucks every day who have no um, fixed addresses. Are they going to be counted as well on their they, motorbikes at the road junction? They are. Let me give you an example. At the last meeting we had in Ali Mosho, was it on Thursday or so? Yeah, no, this week, Tuesday or Wednesday, we, because we usually hold meetings to know the update, how we're going, how many houses we're covering. A question like this was raised. One of the demarcators said he got to a place in Ejibo and that he discovered that in the night you have a lot of malams they just put their mats on the road and sleep what we do in such places is there is a house they sleep in front right we use a house as a number we must count them so how about under Kara bridge that yeah we house. count that's even junction. easier for us because they are even under a roof we're even oh. talking about people that sleep on the street oh, wait, we count wait, 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 wait. Slow okay down. so the bridge they're sleeping is under the bridge that's it's a, a roof covering. it's a covering it's a covering so we use <laughs> If we can tell you that we're numbering generator houses, you know what I mean, because it's covered. Once it is covered, and you know for structures, once you are above foundation level, we number it as well. We do. Because you see, we're talking about demographic data. And you know that demographic data is the oxygen that a nation breeds. Mm. Without it, no nation can develop. Let me ask you, over the years, um, we have had um, this enumeration programs that have been contested. Um, I remember, I think it was in the Abacha government, or I think it was during the Abacha government, there was a census conducted. I don't remember what year. Even the 2006 was, con was contested. Oh, okay, there have yeah. been a few like that. Yes. What are the things responsible for the, those contestations and how are you getting ahead of it? Few things that we have identified, not really few, but I can tell you some. One is because then it was manual. Now, like I did say, we're leveraging on technology. You have the map of where you're going, so we would know whether you're there, whether you're at a particular... You can be on Channel Street and claim you're on AIT Street. 
You can't stand afar, we check the longitude, you know, and tell us, okay, in China we have 10 people, when you didn't enter to ask how many. You get it now. So we have leveraged on technology, which makes it more precise because we're talking about data. I think that was a major problem. Secondly, because we have leveraged on technology, it helps our own data as well. This time, because we're explaining, I, let me also tell channels, you are the first station that will talk to us on Ali Moshe local government area. You've been talking to us on other areas, but you are the first. But because we've been on a lot of radio programs, so because we're explaining to people, they're beginning to understand household, the meaning of it. Before, they just assume, especially the African culture, mm. if we get to a is ah, all of us are families, mm. so we are one household. And then it makes our data to be inaccurate. So by the time we now assign two enumerators during census proper, which is just for about five to seven days maximum, they're unable to cover all the areas. And that's why all these contestations come up in court. So we've discovered the major thing to do is to get your EAD accurate. Mm. And you know why it must be accurate again? It is the EAD that forms the basis of any national frame of any country. And you know it is a national frame that the government relies on to create infrastructures, to create even local governments, to create anything that brings modern livability to the people. It is the enumeration area demarcation data. There's one of those, there were also allegations back then that one of the factors was also cultural. Some people don't like uh, you. You don't. Am I come off or long? <laughs> <laughs> Something That's like true. that. That's true. That's also part of it. So how how? You what we're doing about that is the kind of thing we're doing with you now that you are helping us to do. We speak to them and explain to them that if you don't let us count your children you would be the one to lose out at the end of the day. This time, Olomo must cow more because that is the only way government can plan for you. Yes. For example, you know we also do birth registration. If you don't do your birth registration, if you don't register, you, if you don't know how many children you have in a local government, how would we compel our government to build enough schools for those children? Do you know that if there is accurate demographic data, we can check corruption? Because we'll be able to tell the government the number of houses, the number of youths, the number of women, the number of children, so they need social number of hospitals. And then when they come, when our leaders come with their budget, we can all look at it and say, no, you can't tell us we want to do 10 schools there when there are only two children. That is not true. Then why are you not having a road or an express road from Igondo to VI if that was necessary? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Or why do you want to have an express road from Igondo to VI when you know that the Igondo people are local worries and they'd rather just remain in the environment, build the schools for them there, build hospitals, build cottage industries for their youths and let them remain there. It is demographic data that is the number one way of checking corruption. Mm. And it is because we lack it as a nation. That's why it appears our leaders are just beating their fists in the air. It's impossible to manage a nation successfully without, without data. data. Now, Mrs. Sunday, um, I am assuming that this kind of um, engagement is also going in the States. You are the commissioner for Lagos State. So are you therefore saying that this time we are going to get, well, should we say near accurate details of our numbers in Nigeria? I want to say that I am very confident, particularly in Lagos State, with the kind of work we have done. I have been on air practically every day explaining it to my people. <laughs> Don't forget I'm also a Lagosian, I'm a Wuri, and I'm from Igondu. So I know that my people are very local, a lot of people do not understand. It's funny. Even our so-called educated people don't understand the concept of household. The problem, we are going to Etiosa after Ali Mosho. The problem I'm envisaging in Etiosa, which we've already seen, we have counted over a thousand gated estates in Etiosa. In some places in Etiosa, you can't enter their estates. Look at Banana Island. You must have a code. And the code will expire within 30 minutes. VGC. With all yes. these areas. And because they're also highly educated, there's an air which you respect to intelligence and all that of arrogance. They look at you, why are you disturbing me? You're disturbing my family. So we're using this medium to plead with them. Just give us, it's a two minute question, how many households? If you understand households, then we just click it in and that is it. Okay. Um, what we were talking about at the beginning of the segment, <laughs> your uh, awareness campaign. I mean, all the cultural things we've spoken about, all those barriers will be broken if people are aware that this thing is happening, they identify with it. And it's for their benefits. Exactly. 
So, how is your awareness campaign going? We haven't heard any jingles that we can be singing to, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, this is an enumeration area and demarcation, but in Lagos State, we have jingles on radio. We actually, you know, I did say it the last time that we approached channels. When we saw your bill, we knew that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you just like crocosm, really, because we were very. Yeah, but you know, like um, national, like my big sister said that the other told We all know that oh, look, but no, that so kind of money, yeah. Lagos has not been able to. The commission has not been able to put. You know together. why? The commission treats every state on equal basis. So whether it is Bayelsa or Nasarawa or Ikiti, you get ten naira that the same Lagos gets. Um, but um, airtime in Bielsa will not cost the same thing as airtime that in Lagos. It. But when it comes to census proper, the commission takes that from the headquarters. But for enumeration area demarcation, they expect that you make do with what, what you have. Exactly. Okay. When does uh, the my, census my, my start? Apologies. Let me reiterate the question that you just raised now. Because unless you know, people have an understanding of the need to be counted, this is not 2006. And this is not 1995. Mm -hmm. This is 2021, and you're going to be doing this in 2022. Mm -hmm. If people do not know, and they're not carried along, they're not given an understanding, they will not respond. And we have talked so many times about the poverty level, illiteracy level, and all of that. So um, shouldn't the National Population Commission be thinking about voting massively for... Publicity. That's so correct. And I want to assure you that the current chairman, every Saturday, we have a program with NTA. Okay. Do you know what I mean? We're trying. We've, we've done better than before. But I would also be honest, we're not yet where we want to be. Hmm. That's the truth. Okay. But we're improving greatly on it. Yeah. Well, we can continue. We actually, in Lagos State, we actually wrote to channels because we know you have, you have friends. Very quickly, uh, that question <laughs> of exact date that the census will be yes. in. Yes. We're looking at the second quarter of 2022. Which is between April May, and June. May, yeah. okay. okay. That was about. All right. So, people, gear yourselves up. Between April and June next year, you're going to get knocks on your door and census officials are going to come around to count. And remember... If the state is not apprised of data regarding how many people there are, how many children there are, it will not make adequate arrangements for us. You will find an area that has a population of 10,000 children and three schools. That's why these kinds of things happen. So it is imperative that we all stand up and be counted. Thank you very much for coming. Any last some? message? Yes, my last message is because we're talking about census, not enumeration here. Yeah. It's always observed in Lagos State that during census, there's what we call census migration. People tend to leave Lagos State for their own states. Oh. They genuinely think that it's better to be counted at, in their own, and at home. That's the word. But what is but important a, is where they live. Not just that. If you work in Lagos, you, work, you get a good job here, your children go to school here, Every good gift God has given you is from Lagos State here. Yeah. When it's time to be counted, you go to your state. And then after we have counted, you come back come here. Back. You can see why our data is really upside down. Yeah. Mm. But if you stay where you are where and you we live. count you, yes, where you live, where your children are, with your family, and we count you here, by the time we count you here, then your state counts exact figures of who they are to manage. There will be no room for corruption. It goes back to the publicity that we talk about. Yes. People need to know what to do. They need to understand. That's because what this census no, no migration is such about. I, I've always said, I believe that census migration should be penalized. It should be, it's criminal. Because you're the one turning all the data upside down. You are, you are, you are well, your jingles more. should tell us that. You are already taking more of our time and you pay more. <laughs> <laughs> but you know I'm talking Mrs. about. Mrs. Salu Salu better for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Abimbala Salu, Hyundai Federal Commissioner, National Population Commission, Lagos State. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much for Thank coming you. to get us up to speed about what the National Population uh, Commission is planning for next year, 2022. Thank you. Sunrise will be back in a bit. Stay with us. That's the next um, topic that we are considering. Dyslexia. I'm, I almost didn't know how to pronounce it. Dyslexia. Dyslexia. Okay. 
Well, we understand it's a learning disorder that involves difficulty in learning to read or interpret words. Maybe I had a little bit of it. This, what? This Many people likes. do and they're not even aware. Are you the expert? No, I'm not the expert. Okay, good. Let's, let me talk to the expert. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, you will unzip it after now. Ben Arikpo joins us this morning to have this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. It's nice to be here. But she wants to... Uh, is she correct? Absolutely correct. Okay, so you can unzip your mouth. All right. Yeah. That people <laughs> have dyslexia and they don't know. No, they don't. Because most people with dyslexia don't show any physical signs that you would say... I see. No, you know when we classify disabilities, they see people who are disabled, they see physical disabilities mm -hmm. or visual impairments. And so when you talk about this, uh, dyslexia, people think, oh, there must be a sign. One of the things my son told me when he was having this situation was, even when he tells people he had dyslexia, they didn't believe him because they didn't see any physical signs of disability. Okay, so what are the symptoms? Oh, good. What, first, what is it? Okay. Already, you defined it clearly. People who have dyslexia will struggle to read, write, spell, and comprehend because it's a brain condition. It's not a disability, neither is it a disease. So you can see someone walking on the road, I mean, in the offices. But many people mask it in the offices, and especially when they're not given uh, enough care as infants or childhood. Then they grow up with it. They know, they have so they know something is wrong. I was speaking on the they program. They can't tell. They can't tell. They can't put a finger on it. I was speaking on the program once and then over the radio. And then somebody called later on and said, Kush. He found he drove to the center and said, listen, I thank God that I heard you speak. Because at least for the first time, I can put a finger on what is wrong with me. Mm. I've always known that something is wrong, but I can't say what it is. So dyslexia is a brain condition that makes people unable to read, write, spell, and comprehend. The signs include inability to even decipher sounds in words. You know, when we start reading, we start with the sound in the alphabets, okay. different from the sounds, the vowels, sounds. That is a total no-no for them. Give, give, give us an instance. Okay, for, for instance, cat. The word cat has three sounds. K -t. But the word call has a different, instead of C-A-L-L, -L. well, how would you pronounce call? Why don't you say ka? ka. ka. <laughs> because the first one is cut, ah, sound. Yeah. The next A you see is O. Oh. Oh. How? English is not an easy language. No, it's not. Including the word <laughs> island. Exactly. Island. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, such things, you see, and in your brain, because of their cognitive skills, they find it difficult to decipher those sound codes. Mm. But it doesn't necessarily things. affect their grades, does it? It does affect their grades because first, if they can't read, I mean, they give you an exam question to read and you can't read it, you sit and wait. That's part of the challenge. They can't read. They can't write legibly. They can't spell correctly. And because they can't read, their reading is choppy. They count the words. And so those words they are reading don't make sense. So comprehension is also affected. In the end, wow. they take too long to even answer questions. So... That's part of the things that parents are struggling with. And the challenge is, because they do not show any physical signs, they don't show any disability, as we say. Mm. So people don't... Ah, recently, a father told me when he came, his wife had been pushing, and eventually he came after the child had done the assessment. When I was giving him the result, he was looking at me. I mean, you could see the disdain in his face. At the end, he said, see... So you found an English name for my child's laziness. Wow. <laughs> I was... <laughs> I was taken aback. I said, sir, so despite it's everything I said, despite the symptoms I showed you, uh. his inability to focus and concentrate. You saw that. He said, yes, that's laziness. He, does, he just does what he likes. Is this a class condition or it's just a condition? It's, it's a condition. It's not a class condition. It's not a respect of environment or quality of teaching. It's just that they, that's where the person is born. You see, God in his infinite wisdom has created people differently. Mm. He's created this ones also differently. There's a strength they have which we don't maximize. Our educational system does not follow that trend of developing them. 
and I don't want to talk about education today. Yeah. <laughs> now, they are wired in such a way that they, are not full, they don't follow routine. If they, that's why they do better in uh, objective exams. Because looking at the question in an ex objective exam, they can guess the answer. You know, nine times out of ten, they guess right. But when they get to the essay type question yeah. to write, some of them have a brain-to-hand coordination problem. The brain, they know it, but they can't write it. There's no connection between the brain and the hand. So they have to be taught how to do that. That's why when you ask them questions orally, they can answer verbally correctly. But then ask them to write right. that. That's why they struggle, because they can't. There's no connection. But it, uh, mm. as that father you talked about said, uh, it's natural for many people in our environment to think it is laziness. Yes. Mm. So how significant mm. is that challenge with parents yeah. tracking that as an issue that they need to give con uh, con attention to? Now, let me give you typical statistics. In, in Nigeria or worldwide, the, the, the proportion of people with dyslexia is 10 to 20 percent of any population. So if you have a classroom of um, 10 students, let's assume, it's more likely that 10 percent of them, 20 percent of them have dyslexia. But recently in one state in Nigeria, I don't want to name it because the research has not yet been published, the statistics showed that one in three children in Ouch. public primary schools in that state show significant signs and symptoms of dyslexia. One in three. Now, why is it so prevalent in that community, in that uh, area? That's because the research was done in the first instance. It could be that it is a widespread across all Nigeria, but because nobody has done the research. We don't know. Yes, yes we don't know. Yes. But it's also because if you look at the way, I mean, I've, okay, let me put another factor in there. Teachers, 87% of teachers who came to our training in 2019 never heard of the word, nor do they know the signs and symptoms of dyslexia. 87%. These are the people we trust our children to. And most of these people came from private schools that are expectedly better than public schools. I mean, not in Lagos, though. Okay. Um, hmm. uh, uh, this might well, be a little problematic. This question yeah. might be a little problematic. For how long has this been on? We have been at the Dyslexia Foundation, we've been running since 2015. I mean, for how long, if, can you backtrack how, for how long we've had this as a peculiar issue in Nigeria? It's always been there. In 2015, when we started this process, well, I, started, I came into it because I had a child with dyslexia. At nine, at nine years old, I didn't know. My wife was always telling me, uh, this boy is not doing well, I say, never mind. He will, he don't complain with his siblings, he will get over he'll, it. He'll catch up. He'll catch up. Yeah. And all, Parents, and that's the attitude of most men anyway. Women pick it up faster than men because women are closer to the children in terms of the education. Thank God, and thank God for good women. Mm. But the time she traveled, as God will arrange his own things in his own way, the lesson teacher traveled or fell sick, and she traveled, and I was given the burden to take care of his revision to go back to school. Of course, that's when I discovered it. My wife was correct. Mm. And then I started looking for solutions for two years, and I didn't find any within Nigeria. So I had to take him abroad, and then, to the glory of God, I came to a brain training program. I couldn't afford to do it there because it was expensive. To the glory of God, we bought the franchise and brought it to Nigeria and put him on the training program. In five to nine months, he starts turning around. As we speak, he's 18. He finished school certificate. Hmm. He wrote jump and has passed his jump. Okay. So, so now, there is so, a cure. So, okay. Good. Cure is not the word. You can manage. You can manage it. You can train the brain. You see, the brain is maniable. You know, the, the new science of the brain talks about neuroplasticity. You, the brain is like a plastic. You can mend it. You can change it. Bend it. Yes. So by training the brain, which is the most powerful thing I found that helps people with dyslexia, just training their brain enables them to correct every deficiency they've had before okay. over a period of time. Quick one. Yes. I don't know how many, how much, how many more minutes they will have on this conversation, but you talk about taking the test. Yeah. For many, many people looking at me now who are already in leadership positions, in their offices, in the private sector, in the public sector, and they may have been having issues themselves that they can't put a finger on. How do they take that kind of test? There are many ways of taking the test. One is, even in your home, if you contact us within your home, you can take the test right there. On our website, 
www.dyslexiafoundation.org.ng, there is an assessment you can take right on the website okay. that gives us an indication. And then from there, we can follow up to the next level. Right in your home, you can do it. You can bring the child to the center. Please Where is the center? No, 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 before you go, we'll come to that center. Um, uh, please give us that website again. Maybe my director will be able to put it up so that okay. people can see how they can go there to right. the test. www.dyslexiafoundation.org.ng Okay. If they go there, there's a section there that says free assessment, okay. the free dyslexia assessments. If you click on that, it gets to a box, you know, you feel those things yourself. It will give us a result, it will post to us the result of your assessment. Mm -hmm. And then we'll give you a call and say, based on your assessment, this is what we see. We might have to do a proper, because that's only a screener, a highlight, it's a quick, quick and dirty assessment mm -hmm. that tells us you have or you don't have it. Okay. So we do that. And then if you say, okay, you need to get to the main assessment. In the main assessment, there are three levels of it. One, we test for the cognitive skills. Because behind every struggling and learning challenge is a cognitive problem. Mm -hmm. Whether it is found and rooted in autism or rooted oh. in... Yeah. Okay. Someone can be autistic and still be dyslexic. Some people are oh, interested yeah. now. Yeah. Dyslexia Foundation dot, dot, o -R -G dot ng. Dot ng. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You know, so you are saying that dyslexia is connected to a number of other brain conditions? Yes. Uh-oh. Um, the brain condition is connected to other learning challenges. Learning challenges. So you could be autistic and also dyslexic. Wow. You could be... Double you jeopardy. Could, yeah, you could have cerebral palsy and then you have dyslexia. Okay. Dyslexia is just that bit that has to do with reading, writing, spelling and comprehension. And most times attention. How far, if it is undetected mm. and consequently on, on, on taking care of, Untreated. not taking care of, yeah. how significantly does it affect someone's trajectory in life? Wow, everything. I'm honestly, see, when it's untreated, when it is not managed at the time it should be managed, now you, let's, let's assume one of the greatest challenges we find today is the number of children who are out of school. Even if you take Lagos, for instance, why do people fall out of school? Most of it is traceable to dyslexia. When they oh. go to school, they are unable to read. The teachers join the class in making fun of them. They lose their self-esteem. The next thing is they run out of class to the streets. What do they do when they get to the streets? They find some activity. 80% of juvenile cases in U.S., and the research has not been done in Nigeria. I'm, I'm hoping by ex extrapolation in Nigeria are the result of uh, dyslexia. People unable to read. Yes, you I'm have not. helped us to scratch the surface. And yes. <laughs> if we didn't have another segment coming up, I would say we'll take this on continually. But um, uh, this is we'll, definitely we'll have to we'll have to bring we'll you have back. Have to bring you back, please, please. to have this because this is an again. eye opener. Mm -hmm. Sincerely, oh. sincerely, especially for many many parents who've yeah. been wondering what's wrong with my child. Yeah. But well, just before I, I go, I'll say, that's one of the reasons why, as you know, October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. Okay. And on Saturday from 10 to 12, we're going to be having an open house okay. where we have created enough awareness on radio and, and all of this. Also. So parents, if you're here and you want to join to ask a question or to clarify your doubts or even meet, for instance, a woman said, when her husband took a second wife, that's when a chicken ate her daughter's brain in the dream. And from then they... She couldn't read again. Such things. Yeah, so we want to clarify this. Yeah. So you know, we need to do that. So on the 30th, Saturday, from okay. 10 to 12, we have an open house. Just okay. the information is on our website already. You can register through there and be part of it. So that website again is dyslexiafoundation.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.org.
reform the police force. He is also famously known, Obia Kaur. Ebuka Alvan is also well known as Alvan Midman. Thanks for joining us this morning, Alvan. Uh, good morning. Oh, good morning. Trust you well. Uh, first yeah. of all, that second part of your famous name, Midman, not Man Mid. <laughs> Let's start from there. Um, the name Midman, actually, I got that name back then in university. Um, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine, and uh, I was like, ah, God, I want to be a Midman someday. And he said, ah, that name will fit you. <laughs> that was how I got the name Midman. You know, and I adopted it. I started using Midman because I wish to be a Midman someday. I wish to be successful someday. And um, that's what I'm thinking about Midman. What, 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 what does it mean? Midman, like someone that is made already, you're telling yourself you're a Midman. You don't even need anybody to tell you. You're convinced to yourself. You're motivating yourself. You're, you are a Midman. You, you're successful already. It's like you're taking it in. Filmmaking seems to be the thing for so many people now. And um, first of all, you, you, you are a pole science graduate and a filmmaker. Are you making political films? Uh, no, actually, political science is uh, a course that I studied. You know, I love politics at some time. And uh, I just wanted to gain knowledge more on politics. Uh, that's why I studied political science. You know, film on the other side is uh, I was born into a media family, so I uh, have everything about media. I got it firsthand, so it's not like I learned the media thing, but it has been inborn growing up. You know, I always go to TV stations. I've been going for production, so that one is on its own. Media is on its own. The political side is on its own. Yes, so um, Alvin, why did you make a film on police brutality? Look, po police brutality is something that has been on for years. Um, it's not like it started today. People have been complaining about it. I've had my own personal experience. And uh, every family in Nigeria has an experience, you know. We all have a story to tell about what we witnessed in the hands of Nigerian police. And um, I remember an encounter I had with them back there in Asaba in 2000 and, uh, 2017. SAS personnel beat me up. And I reported to the authorities, and they took it up, and they invited them. I saw that same SARS guy that beat me up, that looked like a monster at night, beat me up, actually. And that morning, when they invited him over, he was as meek as dove. I was looking at this guy, this same guy who beat me up with this. You know, he was pleading with me that I should forgive him. Later on, I forgave him, because I'm a, I'm a quiet guy, and I'm cool and calm, and I have a soft spirit, so I forgave him. But then... I asked myself, what if I reacted, I overreacted that night, what would have happened, you know? And uh, I know a lot of youths have experienced something like that. You know, a lot of them did not live to tell the story, but I lived to tell my story because I was school and camp that night. I was collected. And at the end of the day, I went back to home scratched. But I know there are, there are a lot of people that can take that from them and you know what the story will turn out to be. And I thank God I survived them. Countless times, not just that one, it has happened repeatedly. You know, so I took it upon myself to tell that story. That story actually is something I experienced. I've experienced that same one I told in that film. If you go to the short film, I had that experience. And um, it's countless of them. At the same time, I wanted to pay homage to those that lost their life during the NSAS protest. And to tell you, story, because I noticed that during the NSAS protest, a lot of our elites did not really understand. They thought maybe uh, that we were trying to topple the government or the youths who are trying to make noise. You know, they didn't really understand the direction the protest was coming from. So I wanted to put it up on the screen to set this threat so they understand that this is our point. These guys are brutalizing us. You know, there was a time, some of my creative friends, if I invite them over to come and walk, like, come over, let's come and walk. They say, ah, I'm not get time for this sassy people. We are scared of going out with our phones. We are scared of going out with our laptops. Creatives couldn't go out with their systems. That was a time in this country. Our parents never knew about that. A lot of elites never knew about that because they were in their high horse. They didn't care to know. So I decided to tell that story. So to set the record straight, the reason why we're protesting is all about SARS brutality. It's all about rebranding these guys. It's all about changing the whole system. Thank you. 
we at the end make any suggestions regarding how to solve this problem? It's simple. The police, no matter how I want to look at it, they are still part of the society. You know, a policeman, they are our brothers, they are our sisters, and you cannot do without them. They are the ones that, they will still have a lot of good policemen in the police force, you know, but when, when the majority are bad, that's, we're going to assume everybody there is bad, you know, so we need rebranding. We need to rebrand them. We need to change uh, the, 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 the mood of engagement, the modus operandi, you know, because uh, we cannot do without the police in our system. We can't do away with them. So we need to change the way they react to the people in society because we need them. They will need to win the heart of the people, you know, and that's going to start from repackaging them, rebranding them, but with the way they talk to people, with the way they dress, their attitudes, you know. I believe the government can do a lot in rebranding the Nigerian police system because they need to win our hearts. You can't go to the police system now to go and lay a report. You can't do that because you're scared. You don't know what's going to happen. Maybe they, they might arrest you and say that you are, you are, you are one of those people that did that thing. So people need to, when you see a police man, you feel at home, you feel relaxed. So that government should focus more on that, on police being friendly and within the hearts of the people. Not when some people, you are driving, you are driving to a police checkpoint, some people take a different route. A lot of people do that. Not because they don't have their papers, because anything is not complete. It's just that they don't want to be delayed or they don't want anybody, they don't want anything that will turn up because they don't know what is going to happen. So that's just it. I believe the government can do more on a brand and jump police system. The people, the citizens, have an understanding of what the policeman goes through. Um, yes, I believe we have an understanding of what they go through. I'm not, their job is not an easy one. Waiting AK-47 and standing on the road, it's, it's not easy. And at the same time, the salary, what they take home at the end of the day, is nothing to write to them about. I believe the government can do more in encouraging them because when they are encouraged, they will do more. You know, and if you are taking a bigger salary back home, I, I, I believe me, I've done, I'm not sure if you're going to do more because I believe that's why they uh, take drives on the road because uh, they don't have much to rely on, you know, and they need good welfare. You know, their family needs to be fixed up. Their children need to be in good schools. You know, they need to be assured that even if they are not there anymore, that their family will look up. Uh, their family is going to be looked on. And um, I believe that's actually what the government can do about that. Let's talk about the industry that you're in, the movie-making industry. Well, you are telling what in music they call conscious music. You are essentially using movies to talk to people about things that are, that are important to them. Making that kind of movie, um, conscious movie, if I can call it, uh, I don't know what you call it in the industry. How, how, how much of an opportunity do you think it is, first in the industry, and then in achieving the purpose of educating and enlightening people about the issues raised therein? You know, because it's something every family has experienced. It's something when you go out this morning, you get to experience and get to uh, see it. You see it every day. You go out, you witness it. So uh, people will definitely relate to it. Uh, uh, the movie now has done thousands of views on YouTube. That shows that people love it. That shows that people uh, 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 can relate to the story. And the reviews I've been getting are fantastic. You know, this is the first film I'm actually doing. I've not done film before. I've been doing doc uh, documentaries and commercials and video ads, you know, but this is the first time I decided to do a film. And I hope to do more things like this because I believe it's going to preach not just to only youth, but the parents at the same time, they have a lot to learn from it. So everybody has, every, everybody has something to learn from this uh, movie or from the conscious movie way that I like to say. So it's, it's something every family will definitely enjoy and I'm sure it's going to go places. Asking about the genre of movies. Um, it could be about family planning, we said this earlier, it could be about um, dyslexia, we talked about the other time, it could be about just about anything to bring up the issues, like Concussion, that movie that featured Will Smith. Uh, it, it definitely helped many people to know the challenges of a particular sport. How viable do you think that kind of movie is um, or could be to developing to development in our own country. 
you made my own movie. Particular genre of movies that you made? Okay. Uh, it's going to uh, contribute a lot because um, I believe the government pays attention. They definitely see this film. And uh, uh, a lot of a lot police system at the same time, Nigerian police force, they will pay attention when they see this movie. And definitely when they see, they will get to understand firsthand what we're trying to, the message we're trying to pass across, which is rebrand these guys and change the way they behave. You know, so uh, definitely the genre is going to change a whole lot. It's going to make the government to wake up. At the same time, our elites will get a firsthand uh, picture of what we are trying to talk about or, the, or what we are complaining of. So that's it. Alvin, let's let's compare uh, uh, our movie industry today to what it was ten years ago. What are your thoughts? A lot has a lot has changed. You know, there are a lot of people that have been here before me that have been doing what I'm doing before me, and I respect them. I look at their works. I'm inspired. I you know, uh, likes of Kula Kalayo, likes of Kimi Aditiba. Mention them on and on. A lot of them. So. 10 years back, and we look at what we're doing now. Music movie has gone global. We talk about, we have bigger platforms now. We have Netflix, we've got YouTube, where you can put all your stuff like I just did. You know, before it wasn't like that. Before it was cassettes and CDs. If you don't have that, you need a lab to push out your movie. But now, you don't need them anymore. In Netflix, you can do anything you want. With the internet, you just need small data and your, your movie is flying. You know, my movie did 1,000 views less than a day. And that's because of YouTube. I'm not sure if I had done the normal uh, uh, channel, which is uh, pushing it via cassette and CD, which I don't have the resources to do. I'm not sure I would get up to that. So a lot has changed in 10 years, and I'm here to consider on that. I'm here to contribute my own quota to see where we can push my Nigeria movie to. And uh, I'm here to stay, and I believe that in 10 years' time, too, a lot is going to change, a lot is going to evolve. Thank you. On and on with you, um, you, you, you know your onions, as they say. So, but um, we definitely will be looking out to hear more from you and about you and all that you're doing as you get into the big screen. But for now, we have to thank you very much for being a part of our program this morning. Alvan Midman um, is his name. Al Alvan Ebuka Obiakot as his real name. Thank you so much for your time this morning, and we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you for closing sunrise for us this morning. I'm Alero Edu, wishing you all the best. See you next week. And I'm Ayo Makinde. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Bye for now.